Chapter 8 Chris pursued an icy apparition through the storm-torn forest, a creature that was now wolf, now wind, now an unholy amalgam of both. It glared back over its shoulder at him through snow swirls that half obscured it, bearing icicle fangs and radiating cold and evil. He shivered, unable to control the trembling of his hands, though he clenched them on his weapons to still their shaking. His weapons. He looked down, surprised to see that his bow was in his hands, an arrow knocked and ready. The beast ahead of him snarled, dissolved into a spin of air and sleet with hell-dark eyes, then transformed back into a leaping vulpine snowdrift. He sighted on it, and more than once, but the thing never gave him a clear target. Talia was somewhere ahead of him. He could hear her weeping brokenly above the wailing of the wind and the howling of the wind wolf, and when he looked down he could see her tracks, but he could not seem to spot her through the curtains of snow that swirled around him. He realized then that the wind wolf was stalking her. He quickened his pace, but the wind fought against him, throwing daggers of ice and blinding snow swarms into his eyes. The thing ahead of him howled, a long note of triumph and insatiable hunger. It was outdistancing and outmaneuvering him, and it would have Talia before he could reach her. He tried to shout a warning, and woke with a start. Outside, the wind howled like a demented monster. Talia touched his shoulder, and he jumped involuntarily. Sorry, she said. You... you were dreaming, I think. He shook his head to clear it of the last shreds of nightmare. Lord, I guess I was. Did I wake you? Not really. I wasn't sleeping very well. He tried to settle himself and found that he couldn't. A vague sense of apprehension had him in its grip and would not loose its hold on him. It had nothing to do with Talia's problems. A quick exchange of thought with Tantris confirmed that she was not at fault. Chris, do you think maybe we should move the supplies? Talia said, in a voice soft and full of hesitation. That doesn't sound like a bad idea, he replied feeling at once that somehow his uneasiness was connected with just that. Why? What made you think of that? I kept dreaming about it, except I couldn't shift anything. It was all too heavy for me, and you wouldn't help. You just stood there staring at me. Well, I won't just stand and stare at you now. He began unwinding himself from the blankets. I don't know why, but I think we'd better follow up on your dream. They moved everything from behind the station to either side of the door on the front. Rather than diminishing, the sense of urgency kept growing as they worked, as if they had very little time. It was hard, chilling, bitter work to manhandle the clumsy bundles of hay and straw through the snow, but neither of them made any move to give up until the last stick and bale was in place. While there was still light left to see by, they took turns clearing the valley of deadfall. They finally had enough to satisfy Chris when they'd found the last scrap of wood that hadn't vanished into snow too deep to be searched. It would not outlast being snowed in, but there was more than enough to outlast the storm. If, when the storm died, they couldn't reach any more deadfall, they would cut one of the trees surrounding the station, evergreens with a resinous sap that would allow them to burn, even though green. But when they returned to their shelter, their work wasn't complete. For though there seemed little rational reason to do so, they continued to follow their vague premonitions and moved all the supplies from the storage shed into the way station. It made things very crowded, but if they didn't plan on moving around much, it would do. By the time they finished, they were as chilled and weary as they had been the first night. They huddled over the fire with their bowls of stew, too exhausted even for conversation. The wind howling beyond the door seemed to have settled into their minds, numbing and emptying them, chilling them to the marrow. They huddled in their bed in a kind of stupor until sleep took them. The wind suddenly strengthened early the next morning, causing even the sturdy stone walls to vibrate. They woke simultaneously and cowered together, feeling very small and very vulnerable as they listened with awe and fear to the fury outside. Chris was very glad now that they'd trusted their instincts and moved everything to the leeward side of the station and within easy reach. It's a good thing that this isn't a thatched roof, like the last station we were in, 
Talia whispered to him, shivering against him and plainly much subdued by the scream of the wind outside. Thatch would have been shredded and blown away by now. Chris nodded absently, listening mainly to the sound of the storm tearing at their walls like a beast wanting to dig them out of their shelter. He was half frightened, half fascinated. This was obviously a storm of legendary proportions and nothing he'd ever seen or read could have prepared him for its power. The station was growing cold again, heat escaping with the wind. I'd better build up the fire now and one of us should stay awake to watch it. Talia, make a three-sided enclosure out of some of our supplies or the fodder and pile lots of straw in it. We need more between us and the cold stone floor than we've been sleeping on. Leave room for the forefeets. If it gets too cold, they'll have to fit themselves in near the fire somehow. Talia followed his orders, building them a real nest. She also layered another two bedgowns on over the woolen shift. Chris uncovered the coals and built the fire back up and when he saw the skin of ice forming on their water kettles, he was glad he had done so. They crept back into their remade bed and held each other for extra warmth, staring into the fire, mesmerized by the flames and the wail of the wind around the walls. There didn't seem to be any room for human thought. It was all swept away by that icy wind. Their trance was broken by a hideous, crashing sound, it sounded as though a giant out of legend was approaching the station, knocking down trees as he came. The noise held them paralyzed, like rabbits frightened into immobility. There wasn't anywhere to run to in any event. If something brought the station down, they'd freeze to death in hours without shelter. Neither of them could imagine what the cause could be. It seemed to take several minutes approaching the station inexorably from the rear, finally ending with a roar that shook the back wall and a splintering sound that came unmistakably from beyond the half-door. They sat, shocked into complete immobility, hearts in their throats, for a very long time. Finally, Bright goddess! Was that where I thought it was? Chris gulped and tried to unclench his hands. B b behind the station! Talia stuttered nervously, pupils dilated with true fear. Where the storage shed is? Chris rose and tried the door. It wouldn't budge. Was, he said, and crawled back in beside her. She didn't venture to contradict him. Twice more they heard trees crashing to the ground, but never again so close. And as if that show of force had finally worn it out, the wind began to slacken and die. By noon or thereabouts, it had gone completely, and all that remained were the faint ticking sounds of the falling snow. Without the wind to keep it off the roof, it soon built up to a point where even that could no longer be heard. The station stopped losing heat. The temperature within rose until it was comfortable again, and the rising warmth lulled them back into their interrupted sleep before they realized it. The companions prodded them awake. How long they'd been asleep, they had no idea. The fire was dying, but by no means dead, and the silence gave no clue. Roland impressed Talia with his need to go out, immediately. Talia could tell by Chris's face that Tantris was doing likewise. He looked at her and shrugged. Might as well find out now as later. We're still here, and under shelter at least, he said, and pulled on fresh clothing while she did the same. It was not long till dark. The stacked fodder had kept the door clear of snow or they'd never have gotten it open. Beyond the shelter of the bales was a drift that reached higher than Chris's head. The churras were not at all perturbed by the sight. They plowed right into it, forcing their way almost as if they were swimming, their long necks keeping their heads free of the snow. The companions followed and the two heralds followed them. After making their way through drifts that rose from between the level of Talia's waist to the height of the first one, they suddenly broke into an area that had been scoured down to the grass by the wind. The forest around them had a quality of age, of power held in check that was raising the hair on the back of Talia's neck. There was something here, not quite alive, but not dead either, something waiting watching, weighing them. Whatever it was, it brooded over them for several long moments. 
Talia found herself searching the shadows under the trees until her eyes ached, looking for some sign, and found nothing. But something was out there, something inhuman, almost elemental, and, and at one, in some strange way she couldn't define and could only feel, with the forest itself, as if the forest were providing it with a thousand eyes, a thousand ears. Where's the road? Talia asked in a small, frightened squeak. Chris started at the sound of her voice, looked around, then turned slowly, evidently getting his bearings. The station from here seemed to be only one taller drift among many. There were new gaps in the circle of trees that surrounded it. That way, he pointed finally. There was a tree just beside the pathway in, which is now across the pathway in. Once we get to it, we can have the churros and companions haul it clear, I hope. What about the back of the station? She was not certain that she wanted to find out. Let's see if we can get back there. Working their way among the drifts in the deepening gloom, they managed to get to a point where they could see what had happened behind the station, even though they couldn't get to it yet. Chris whistled. Not one, but nearly a dozen trees had gone over, each sent crashing by the one behind it, the last landing hard against the side of the station. The storage shed was gone, splintered. At least we'll have plenty of firewood, Talia said with a strained laugh. Talia? There was awe in Chris's voice. I never believed those stories about sorrows and Vanyal's curse before, but look at the way the trees fell. Talia subdued her near hysterical fear and really took a good look. Sure enough, the trees had fallen in a straight line, all in the direction of the force of the wind, except the last. There was no reason why it should have deviated that she could see, and had it fallen as its fellows, it would have pulverized the station and them. But it had not. It had fallen at an acute angle, missing the station entirely and destroying only the empty shed. It had almost fallen against the wind. Gods, Chris said. I... I never would have believed this. I never believed in miracles before. He looked around again. I... This sounds stupid, but whatever you are, thanks. The steady feeling of being watched vanished as he said it. Talia found she could breathe easily again. Look, we'd better get back inside. It's nearly dark. Chris gazed up at the sky and the snow that still fell from it with no sign of slackening. Subdued by their situation and the destruction outside, they made their meal, ate, and cleaned up in silence. Finally, Talia broached the subject that was troubling them both. Can we get out of here? I'd like to be reassuring and optimistic and say yes, but truthfully, I don't know, Chris replied, resting his chin on his knees and staring into the fire. It's a long way to the road, and as I've told you, it will be worse beyond the trees. It's going to take us a long time to cut a path there, with no certainty that the guard will have gotten that far when we do make it. Should we try to force our way without cutting a path? He shook his head. The churras could do it, unburdened, but not Tantras and Rowan. Even if they could, we'd need the supplies. I just don't know. Maybe we'd better just concentrate on digging our way out. But how can we dig ourselves out with no tools? There's the tree blocking the way, too. Chris stared at the fire without speaking for a long time. Talia, he said finally. Holder folk never buy anything if they can help it. Their miserliness is legendary. What do you know about making shovels? Not much, she replied ruefully, but I'll try. Let's take an inventory of our materials. They had plenty of rawhide for lashings, lots of straight, heavy tree limbs for handles and bracings, but nothing to use for blades. The unused bed boxes were so stoutly built that it would be next to impossible to pull the bottoms out, and the shelves were made of board too thick to be useful. There had been thinner wood used in the shelves of the shed, but they were fragmented now. Finally, Talia sighed sadly and said with reluctance, 
The only thing we have to use is the harp case. No, Chris protested. There's nothing else. When we leave here, we can detune my lady and wrap her in blankets and cloaks, and she should be all right without the case. The wood is light and strong, and it's been waterproofed. It's nearly even the right size and shape. We haven't got a choice, Chris. Jadis wouldn't thank us for being sentimental fools. Damn. He was silent for a moment. You're right. We haven't any choice. He got the case from the corner on top of Talia's packs where he'd left it. Wincing a little, he took his hand axe and carefully pried the front and back out of the frame and handed them to Talia. She fished a bit of charcoal out of the fireplace and drew something like the blade of a snow shovel on each piece. She handed him one while she took up the other. Try and whittle it to that shape while I do the same. She shaved delicately at the edges of the wood with the blade of her own axe, with shavings falling in curls next to her. Chris watched her with care until he felt he knew exactly what she was doing, then began on his own piece. There was one blessing. The grain was fine enough that with sharp axes it was relatively easy to shape. When both their pieces approximated the look of a shovel blade, Talia marked holes in the boards for them to drill out with their knives. By the time they'd finished, their wrists and hands were tired and sore. Talia flexed her hands, trying to get some feeling and movement back into them. Now I need two pieces about so wide, she said, gesturing with her hands about two fingers width apart, and as long as the backs of the blades. I expect you'll have to cut them out of the frame. While Chris further demolished the harp case, she rummaged in her packs for her pot of glue. When she found it, she placed it in a pot half filled with water and put that container over the fire so the glue would melt. Meanwhile, she went through the dozen or so branches that looked to be good handle material and picked out the two best. Once the glue was ready, she showed Chris where to drill holes in the branches and how to taper the end that was going to be fastened to the blade. Her wrists just weren't strong enough for the job. When he finished the first one, she lashed it to the blade with wet rawhide, stretching the thong as tightly as she could so that it would shrink and bind the shovel to blade as firmly as possible when it dried. Then she cross-braced the back of the blade with a smaller branch cut to fit, lashing it the same way to the handle. Lastly, she glued the piece of frame to the back of the shovel blade to act as a stop to keep the snow from sliding off. She lashed another piece of branch to the handle behind the stop to act as a brace. Then she glued every join on the whole makeshift shovel, saturating even the rawhide with glue. That finished all she knew how to do. She set the whole thing aside to cure overnight and started in on the second. They're not going to hold up under much rough handling, she sighed wearily when she'd finished. We're going to have to treat them with a great deal of care. It's better than trying to do it with bare hands, Chris replied, taking her hands in his own and massaging them. I guess so. She tried to force herself to relax. Chris, just how does the guard clear the roads off? They recruit villagers. Then it's teams with shovels. They dig out the worst places and pack down the rest. I don't imagine that it's a very fast process. No. The single word hung in the air between them. Talia was afraid but didn't want to put more of a burden on Chris than he already had by giving way to her fears. The silence between them grew. I hate to say this, he broke it reluctantly, but you're projecting. I can feel it, and I know it isn't me, and Tantris just backed me up. Anger flared a little, followed by despair. Damn it, Talia, lock it down. You're not helping either of us. She gulped back a sob, bit her lip hard enough to draw blood, then steadied herself by beginning a breathing exercise. It calmed her, calmed her enough that she actually found the leakage and blocked it. Chris heaved a sigh of relief and smiled at her, and she felt a tiny stirring of hope and accomplishment. Finally, he let her hands go and went after the harp. She wasn't in a mood to sing by any means, but he chose nothing that she knew. He seemed more to be drifting from melody to melody, perhaps finding his own release from distress in the music he searched. She listened only. The churras seemed to have caught the somber mood and did not sing either. She used the harp song to reinforce her own ritual of calming and did not open her eyes until it stopped. 
Chris had risen and was replacing the harp in its corner of the hearth. He returned to her side and stretched himself next to her without speaking. She was the one who broke the silence. Chris, I'm scared, really afraid. Not just because of what's happening to me, but because of all that. She waved her hand. Out there. I know. A pause. I'm scared, too. We haven't got a good situation here. You... You could have killed us both the other night. You still could. And out there... I've never felt so helpless in my life. Between the two, I just wanted to give up. I just wanted to curl up in a ball and hope it all went away. It cost him to admit that, Talia knew. I wish I wasn't so messed up. I wish I was bigger and stronger. Or a fire speaker like Kettle, she replied in a very small voice. You can't help what happened. As for being a fire speaker, I don't think both of us together could reach someone with the gift to hear us, and if we could, I don't know that it would do any good. Hmm. He sighed. We just have to keep on as we have been and hope we get out of here before the supplies run out. That's the real problem when it comes down to it, the supplies. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry. We've got about enough for a month, but not much more than that. If we run out... Chris, you know we are in Soros. Remember the tree? Maybe... Maybe we'll be sent game. You could be right, he mused, beginning to brighten. It would take less magic to send a few rabbits within reach of our bows than it did to divert that tree. And maybe we'll get out before we have to worry about it. And you don't have to worry about me. You know, I'm border bred. I can do with a lot less than I've been used to eating. Let's not cut rations down unless we have to. We'll be using a lot of energy keeping warm. Gloom settled back over them. Talia decided that it was her turn to dispel it. I wonder what things are like back at court right now. It's almost midwinter. Pandemonium. It's never less. Uncle hates midwinter. There are so many people coming in for the celebrations who just incidentally have petitions that there are council meetings nearly every day. She looked at him unhappily. I don't get along with your uncle very well. No, that's a lie. I don't get along with him at all. I know he doesn't like me. But there's more to it than that. I keep having the feeling that he's looking for a way to get rid of me. Chris looked flatly astonished. Whoa! Wait just a minute here. You'd better start at the very beginning. I can hardly believe my ears. All right, she replied hesitantly. But only if you promise to hear me out completely. That's only fair, I guess. All right. When I first got to the collegium, I had a pretty miserable time of it, as you know. Dirty tricks, nasty anonymous notes, ambushes. It was the unaffiliated students, the blues, but they made it seem as if it was other trainees that might be responsible, so I wouldn't look inside the collegium for help. It all came to a head when they dumped you in the river just after midwinter. And they meant to kill me. What? he exclaimed. It isn't common knowledge. Elkarth and Kirill know, and Cheryl, Karen, Skiff, Taran, and Jerry. Ilsa knew, so did Jadis. I think Albrecht knows, Miro guessed. I'm pretty sure one or more of the others told Selene some time later. One of the Blues told me to give their greetings to Talamir just after they threw me in. I think the meaning there is pretty clear. They expected me to drown, and if it hadn't been that my bond with Roland was strong enough for him to know what had happened. Well, but I was delirious with fever when they were caught, and I couldn't tell anyone. They claimed it was all just a joke, that they hadn't thought I'd get worse than a duckin. Your uncle backed them up before the council. So instead of being charged with trying to kill me, they got their wrists slapped and were sent home to the familial bosoms. That's hardly an indication that you promised not to interrupt me. Sorry. The next time we got into it was over Skeff. It was right when Skeff was helping me unmask Elspeth's nurse Holma. I needed to find out who had sponsored her into Valdemar besides Selene and Elspeth's father. Skiff went to the provost marshal's office to find the immigration records, and Ortholin caught him there. He dragged him up in front of Selene, accusing him of trying to alter the misdemeanor book. And he demanded that Skiff be given the maximum punishment for it, 
stable duty with the guard for the next two years on the border. You know what that could have meant. At worst, he could have been killed. At best, he'd be two years behind the rest of us, and I'd have been without one of my two best friends all that time, as well as being without the only person in the Collegium who could possibly have helped me expose Hulda. I got Skiff off, but I had to lie to do it, and I can tell you that Orthalan was not pleased. Chris looked as if he wanted to interject something, but held his peace. Lastly, there's the matter of my internship. Orthalan, in view of my youth and inexperience, was trying to pressure the council into ruling I should stay out in the field for three years, double the normal time. Fortunately, neither Selene nor Elkarth nor Kirill were having any of that, and pointed out that internships are subject only to the will of the circle, not the council. Is that all? Isn't it enough? Talia, this all has very logical explanations, if you know my uncle. Firstly, he couldn't possibly have known about the students' malice. I'm certain of it. He's known most of them since they were in swaddling clothes. He even refers to people grown and with babes of their own as the youngsters, and he probably felt obligated to act as their spokesperson. After all, you had two people to speak for you on the council, Elkarth and Kirill. I suppose that's logical, Talia said reluctantly. But Skiff, oh, Skiff, my uncle is a prude, and a stickler for convention. I know that for a fact. Skiff has been a thorn in his side ever since he was chosen. Before Skiff came, there was never any problem with heraldic students getting involved in trouble down in town, the unaffiliates and the bardics, and once in a great while the healers, but never the greys. Never? Talia's right eyebrow rose markedly. I find that rather hard to believe. Well, almost never. But after Skiff started his little escapades, Lord and Lady, the greys are as bad as the bardics. It's like the younger ones feel they have to top him. Well, Uncle is not amused, not at all. He's a great believer in military discipline as a cure for high spirits, and I'm certain he never meant anything worse for Skiff than that. What about me? Why does he keep trying to get between me and Selene? He's not. You are young. His idea of Queen's Own is someone like Talamir. I have no doubt he truly felt a long internship was appropriate in your case. I wish I could believe you. Holding a grudge is rather childish and unlike you. I am not holding a grudge. Then why are you even refusing to consider what I've told you? Talia drew a deep breath and forced herself to calm down. There is a third explanation for what he's been doing. It could be that he thinks of me as a threat to his influence with Selene. And I might point out one other thing to you, and that is, I am willing to bet the person who told you all about those rumors is your uncle, and I'd be willing to bet he asked you to investigate them. He knows what my gift is. He could well know what the effect of hearing that poison would be on me. Instead of refuting her immediately, Chris looked thoughtful. That is a possibility, at least over the internship thing. He's very fond of power, my uncle. He's been Selene's chief advisor for a long time and was her father's before that. And there isn't a great deal you can do to change the fact that Queen's Own is always going to have more influence than chief advisor. And I hate to admit it, he finished reluctantly, but you're right about my source of information on the rumors. Talia figured that now that she'd got him thinking instead of just reacting, it was time to change the subject. She would dearly have loved to have suggested that Orthalan might well have originated the rumors, but Chris would never have stood still for the implication that his uncle's conduct was less than honorable. Chris, let's try and forget about it for a few hours anyway. We've got other things to worry about. He regarded her soberly. Like the fact that you had enough energy to project. Like the fact that you could do it again. Yes, she drew a deep breath. I could even break down again. I was right on the verge of it this afternoon. If we hadn't had something to do, I might have. And I was maybe hallucinating out there. Hell, I'll try. But I thought you'd better be warned. Featherfoot? He looked long at Tantris then nodded in satisfaction. 
He says he thinks he and Roland can handle you if it gets bad again. He says it was mostly that Roland was caught off guard that things got out of hand the first time. She felt a heavy burden fall from her heart. Good, and thanks. He gave her a wink. I'll get it out of you. She made a face at him and curled up in the blankets to sleep with a much lighter heart. They woke at very close to their normal time. There would be no dallying today, nor for many days to come, not if they wanted to reach the road before their supplies ran out. They suited up in their warmest clothes, took the shovels, and began the long task of cutting a path to freedom. The snow was wet and heavy, an advantage since it stayed on their shovels better, but the very weight of it made shoveling exhausting work. They took a break at noon for a hot meal and a change of clothing, as what they'd put on this morning was now quite soaked through. They shoveled until it was almost too dark to see. We've got to get to that tree and get it moved out of the way while the snow's still like it is now, Chris said over supper. If it should turn colder and freeze, we'll never be able to get that thing moved. It would be stuck in ice like a cork in a bottle. We'll be all right as long as the snow keeps falling a little. Talia replied, thinking back to her days watching the hold flocks at lambing time. We'll only have to worry about the temperature falling if the weather changes. They turned in early, hoping to get to the tree before the end of the next day. By late afternoon they had reached it, and decided, after looking the massive trunk over, that it would be best if they hacked it in half with their hand axes and hitched the chiras and companions to the lighter half. When darkness fell, they were slightly more than halfway through the trunk. Again they rose with the sun and returned to the tree. They managed to cut through it by noon, and after lunch made their attempt to move it. They had decided the previous night to leave nothing to chance, and had made a set of harnesses for themselves from spare rope. They hitched their own bodies right in beside the Chiras and Roland and Tantras. It turned out that it was just as well that they had decided to do so. Only when all six of them dug in and strained with all their strength did it move at all. All of them gasped and panted with the effort, and overburdened muscles screamed out in protest while the tree shifted fraction by minute fraction. It took until dark to haul it clear of their escape route. As darkness fell, they dragged themselves back into the station, nearly weeping with aches and exhaustion. Nevertheless, they rubbed the churras dry and groomed their companions, fed and watered and blanketed them. Only then did they strip off their own sodden garments, and collapse on their bed. They were too bone-weary to think of anything but lying down, and their aching bodies. Finally, Do you really want supper? Chris asked her dully. It was his turn to make it. The very idea of food was nauseating. No, she replied, in a voice fogged with exhaustion. Oh, good, he said with relief. Neither do I. I can't seem to get warm. It took an effort to get the words out. Me either. Chris sat up with a low moan. If you'll get the tea, I'll dig out the honey. It's a bargain. They'd left hot water for tea on the hearth, knowing they'd want it. Neither of them rose any farther than their knees as they dragged themselves to their goals. Talia poured water onto the herbal mixture spilling half of it as her hands shook with weariness. Chris returned with the jar of honey in one hand and something else in the other. He put the jar down with exaggerated care, and Talia spooned three generous dollops into each mug. Fortunately, it was too thick to spill as the water had. She pushed one mug toward Chris, who handed her something in exchange for it. It was one of the fruit and nut bars Carathan had forced into them back at Waymeat. Talia, felt sick at the sight of it. I know, Chris said apologetically. I feel the same way, but if we don't eat something, we'll pay for it tomorrow. She stirred the honey into her tea and drank it even though it was still so hot it almost scorched her tongue. As heat spread through her, the food began to seem a bit more appealing. As she finished the second mug of tea, she was actually feeling hungry. Chewing the tough, sticky thing took the last of her energy, though. From the look of things, Chris was feeling the same way. The third cup of tea settled the question entirely. She just barely managed to get underneath the blankets before she was asleep. 
She woke with every muscle screaming in angry protest. She shifted position a little, and a groan escaped. I wish I was dead. I wouldn't hurt so much, Chris moaned forlornly in her ear. Me too. But I keep thinking of what Albrecht always told us. Must you remind me? The cure that is best for the sore body is more of what made it sore. Oh, how I wish he was wrong. At least we have to go out long enough to see what we have to deal with beyond the tree. You're right. Chris uncoiled himself, slowly and painfully. And we have to wrestle more wood inside. And more hay. And more hay, right. There's this much, little bird. If you feel like I feel, you couldn't project past your own nose right now. They helped each other wash and dress. There were too many places they couldn't reach for themselves without their stiff muscles screaming at them. Talia managed to concoct porridge with fruit in it, making enough to feed them twice more, and tea as well. They would probably be so tired they wouldn't taste either, but it would be solid and warm, and hopefully they wouldn't be so tired tonight that the very thought of food was revolting. When they opened the door, the glare of the sunlight on all that snow drove them back, for the weather had changed overnight, and the sky was cloudless. Without some kind of protection for their eyes, they'd be snow-blind in moments. Now what? Talia asked, never having had to deal with this kind of situation before. Chris thought hard. Keep your eyes shadowed from above by your cloak hood, and I'll see if I can rig something for the snow glare. He rummaged through his pack, emerging with a roll of the thin gauze they used for bandages. Wrap that around your head about twice. It should be thin enough to see through. It wasn't easy to see through, but it was better than glaring light that brought tears to the eyes. The tree lay where they had left it, and beyond it was the pathway out, somewhere. It was possible to see where it went by the lane between the trees and the absence of underbrush. The problem was that it lay beneath drifts that, from where they were standing, never seemed to be less than four feet deep. Well, at least there's no more downed trees, Talia said, trying to be cheerful. Chris just sighed. Let's get the shovels. The drifts were deep, but at least they were not as wide as the ones in their valley had been. Though the snow was seldom less than two feet deep, it also was rarely more than six. They shoveled and trampled until dusk, then brought in more wood and fodder, ate, and fell into bed. Talia woke in the middle of the night, feeling very cold. Puzzled, she huddled closer to Chris, who murmured sleepily but didn't wake. Despite this, she kept feeling colder. Eventually, she moved warily out of bed. As soon as she did so, the chill of the air struck her like a hammer blow. She slipped her feet into her sheepskin slippers, wrapped her cloak around herself, and quickly moved to pile wood on the fire. When the flames rose, she could see the eyes of the churras and companions blinking at her. They had moved out of their corner and nearer to the heat. Smata, Chris asked sleepily. Why is it so cold? The weather changed again. The temperature's dropping, Talia said, thinking about how the wet snow outside must be freezing into drifts like outcroppings of white granite. I think the look goddess just left us. Chapter 9 When at last they slept again, it was restlessly. They woke early and with a premonition of the worst. The icy chill of the station did not encourage dawdling. They dressed quickly and went out to discover just how bad the situation truly was. It wasn't good by any stretch of the imagination. The snow had frozen, thickly crusted on top, granular and hard underneath. The crust was capable of supporting their weight, and even the weight of the churras unladen, providing that they held their pace to a snail's crawl. But it would never hold the churras with even a small pack or the companions. And as if that weren't bad enough, it was obvious that their shovels were not sturdy enough to deal with snow this obdurate. Both heralds stared hopelessly at the rock-hard place where they'd left off digging the night before, and at the now useless shovels. Finally, Talia swore passionately, kicked at a lump of snow, and bit her lip to hold back tears of frustration, and reminded herself not to let anything leak. 
Look, Talia, we're not getting anywhere like this, Chris said after a long moment of silence. You're tired, so am I. One day isn't going to make any difference to us one way or the other. For that matter, neither will two or three. I'm your counsellor. Well, I counsel that we take a rest and let our bodies recover until we can think of a plan that has some chance of getting us out of here. Talia agreed wearily. Once back inside, she lit the little oil lamp and surveyed the shambles they'd made of the interior of the station. We're obviously going to be here a while, so it's time we stop living in a goat pen. Look at this. We hardly have room to move. Chris looked around and ruefully agreed. They began cleaning and rearranging with a vengeance. Working in the comparatively warm station was by far and away easier than shoveling snow had been. Before noon, the station was cleaned and swept, and all was in good order. Had any ideas? Chris ventured over lunch. Nothing that pertains to the problem. I did think of something that needs doing, though. Since we're stuck until we can think of a way to handle that snow, we ought to do something about washing our clothing. The only warm things that I have left to wear are what I've got on. There's saddle soap in the station supplies to clean the leathers, he said, thinking out loud, and we could empty two of the barrels to wash in. I brought more than enough soap for all the rest, she told him, and the Lord knows we don't have to scrimp on water. All right, then, we'll do it. I'm in no better shape than you, and I hate wearing filthy clothes. Under the primitive conditions of the station, cleaning white clothing was not an easy chore. Again, however, it was easier than the digging and hauling they'd been doing, and a great deal warmer as well. Eventually, every clean surface sported a drying garment. I never thought I'd want to see another set of student greys again, Talia said, sitting back on her heels and surveying her handiwork. I know what you mean, Chris grinned, looking up from his last pair of boots. At least the damn things didn't show dirt quite so badly. How are you doing? I'm done, since I did my leathers while you were washing. This finishes it for me. Well, I still have hot water left, enough for two really good baths. It's too bad we can't fit ourselves into the barrels and soak, but at least we can get really clean. Good thinking, little bird. Although, after all the soap and water I've been immersed in today, there isn't much that needs to soak. Things began to take on a more cheerful appearance once they were clean especially since they weren't aching from the punishing cold and muscle strain of the past few days. Talia combed her wet hair out in front of the fire, more than half mesmerized by the flickering flames and the movement of the comb through her hair. The station had lost the slightly stale odor it had acquired during the blizzard and now smelled of soap and leather, very pleasant. Bits of old tales began to flicker through her mind, unconnected images dealing with tales of battle, of all things. Battles, and how the companions themselves used to fight alongside their heralds. Or were those images unconnected? Chris, she said slowly, an idea beginning to form, the main problem is the hard snow and the ice crust. Our shovels aren't strong enough to break it into pieces. But if we wrapped our legs to keep them from being cut, Roland and Tantris could like they were fighting. By the stars of the lady, you're right, he exclaimed with excitement. Not only that, remember how you wondered what good those huge claws did the churras? They dig themselves hollows to lie in, in dirt or in snow. If we could make them understand what we wanted, we could have them dig out chunks of a size we could manage. Havens. Roland and Tantris can do that. Tantris snorted, and Roland sent Talia a little mental caress. Chris laughed. All right, Grantha, he said to his companion, looking happier than he had all day. He turned back to Talia. The source of all wisdom over there seems to think we'll be able to work faster than we did before. He wanted to know why we hadn't thought of this until now. Well, you two wouldn't have done us much good with the wet snow now, would you? Talia asked, the two sets of backward-pointing ears. Roland tossed his head. And the churras would have made more of a mess than they'd have cleared. The snowdrifts weren't stable enough until they froze, Chris added, a little smugly. So there. Did he say anything else? Talia asked, a little envious of Chris's ability to mind-speak with his companion. He just told me he's been worried about how hard we've been working, 
But then he actually ordered me to rest tomorrow. You'd think we were trainees. Talia shook her head ruefully, for there was no doubt that Roland considered this to be an excellent idea. There was a distinct undertone to his mental sending of worry that both of them had been overworking. Roland says the same. I don't think I want to argue. Oh, bright havens, I hurt. Talia stretched aching arms and shoulders. This has hardly been the rest stop we were ordered to take. Chris groaned good-naturedly, stretching his own weary muscles. If anything, I'm more exhausted than I was when we stopped, if that's possible. I'm certainly a lot sorer. Then I'll make you an offer. Want a back rub? Do you? Oh, Lord, yes, she sighed. I'll work on you, then you work on me. Strip, wench. I can't work through four shirts and a tunic. It's only two, she protested with a laugh. And there's summer weight at that. While I was cleaning, I wanted to clean everything. Nevertheless, she complied, stretching out on a pallet of blankets on the hearth. Chris seemed to find every last ache and drove each one out with deft fingers. Soothed by the gentle hands, she drifted into a half-sleep. He woke her by tickling the back of her neck. My turn, he said as she lazily turned her head. She sighed with content and rose to her knees and slipped on a shift, blessedly clean and warm from the fire, while he took her place on the hearth. She tried to copy what he'd done to her, and hunted for the muscles that were the most tense, and so hurt the most. Before very long she had him as soothed and relaxed as she was, and they basked in the heat of the fire, like a couple of contented cats. "'I'll do anything you ask,' he murmured happily. "'Anything, so long as you don't ask me to move, and as long as you don't stop.' She giggled at the tone of his voice as she gently rubbed his shoulders. All right, then. Tell me about Dirk. Promise not to stop what you're doing. Surely. Good, he said with satisfaction, because it's a very long story. For one thing, I have to start with his grandfather. Oh, come now, she said, raising an eyebrow. Is this really necessary, or are you just trying to prolong the back rub? I promise you, it's absolutely necessary. Now, once upon a time, when Dirk's grandfather settled his steading, he lived on the very border itself. He was quite ambitious, so he added a little more to his lands every year, and only stopped when he had as much as one man could reasonably expect to keep under cultivation with the aid of a moderate number of hands. By then the border had been pushed back by him and others like him. So, now that it was a safer place to live, he married. Logical. Seeing as he had to have produced at least one offspring to be Dirk's father. Quiet, wench. As it happened, their only child was female. But it didn't perturb him that he would be leaving the steading to her. He fully expected that she would marry in due course, and the place would still be in the bloodline. However, the gods had other ideas in mind. Don't they always? First of all, it turned out that his daughter had a really powerful gift of healing. Now, this was as welcome as it was unexpected, since it's hard to get healers to station themselves near the border. There's always more work there than they can handle successfully, unless they're stationed with a temple, and you know how healers are. They'd rather die than leave something half done. At any rate, border-bred healers always seem to feel they have a duty to serve where they were born, so there was little chance she'd end up anywhere else. Her proud and happy father sent her off to the healer's collegium, and in due course she returned in her greens. So far, everything had gone according to expectation. However, being the healer put a crimp in her father's original plans for her. It seemed that the young men of the area were somewhat reluctant to court a person whose attentions could, because of her gift, never be entirely devoted to any one person. And this, despite the tale I told you about them. Healers are, after all, healers first and anything else second. Like heralds or priests, look at us. Point taken. At any rate, not even the rather substantial inducement of her inheritance could lure any of the neighboring farmers or their sons to the nuptial table. The old man began to despair of having his hard-won acreage remain in the family. Then there came the second twist to the plot. Late one autumn night... There was a terrible storm. 
I've had my fill of storms. Hush, this is a required storm. In fact, it was the worst autumnal storm that part of the kingdom had ever seen. It began after sunset, and lightning downed so many trees that it was completely unnecessary to cut any for firewood that fall. Freezing rain fell from the heavens in sheets rather than drops. There was so much thunder that it was impossible to hold a conversation and impossible to sleep. And, in the midst of all this chaos and confusion, there came a knocking on the farmstead door. Chris was very obviously enjoying himself to the hilt. A tall, dark, mysterious stranger, no doubt. Who's telling the story, you or me? As a matter of actual fact, it was a stranger, half drowned, half frozen, half dead, and very much bedraggled, but blonde and hardly mysterious. It was a young bard, only recently graduated from his collegium and starting his journeyman period. He'd lost his way in the storm, fallen into a river, and had all manner of uncomfortable things happen to him. When he pounded on their door, he was already fevered, delirious, and well on his way to a full-blown case of pneumonia. I smell a romance. You have an accurate nose. Naturally, the young healer took him in and nursed him back to health. Just as naturally, they fell head over heels in love. Being a man of honor, as well as having his head stuffed full of all those romantic ballads, the bard begged the old man's permission to wed his daughter in true heroic style. He needn't have worried, because by now the old fellow was beginning to think that any son-in-law was better than none. However, he made it a condition of his agreement that they remain on the steading. It rather surprised the old farmer when the, he thought, feckless, footloose bard agreed with all his heart, subject to the agreement of a circle, of course. How could the old man have known that our bard was born a farmer, and that entwined with his love of music and his love of the daughter was his love and deep understanding of the land? Well, the circle agreed, provided he compose a master's ballad about the storm, courtship and all, and he settled down happily with all three of his loves, land, lady, and music. Then, before the year was out, he had a fourth. Dirk, so that's where he got that wonderful voice. And where he learned to play so well. Actually, though, you're a bit ahead of the tale. The first child wasn't Dirk. He has three older sisters, two younger, and a baby brother. When they can be sorted into some semblance of order and organization, they have family concerts. You should hear them all singing together. It's wonderful. I swear, even the babies cry in the right keys. Well, Grandfather passed to his reward, content in the knowledge that the land would remain in the bloodline, since by the time he departed, two of the girls had begun enthusiastically producing enormous broods of their own. I was asking about Dirk, Talia. My little bird, you can't separate Dirk from his family. They're all alike. See one? You know what the rest are like. How things ever get done in that household, I have no idea, since it seems to be formed entirely of chaotic elements. Just like a bard. Actually, he's the most organized of the lot. If it weren't for him and the husbands of the sisters, they'd spend all their time flying in circles. There's an incredible amount of love there, though, and it overflows generously on anyone who happens to find himself dragged unwittingly into their midst. Like you. Like me. Dirk insisted on hauling me home with him the first holiday after we'd met when he found out there wasn't going to be anyone home with me but the servitors. They treated me exactly like one of the family, from bathing babies to teary farewell kisses. I was rather overwhelmed. I certainly hadn't expected anything like them. Talia chuckled, picturing to herself the reserved, slightly shy young boy that Chris must have been, finding himself in the hands of what must have seemed like a family of madmen. Once I got used to them, I had a lot of fun. That's why, every chance I've had, I've gone home with Dirk when he went. Right now, four of his sisters are married. Three of them live in extensions to the original house, and their husbands share the work on the steading, because Dirk's father has developed bad knees. The last has his own land to look after, but they're still on hand for every holiday in the calendar. It's a good thing they all get along so well. We were talking about Dirk. Right. Chris's eyes gleamed with mischief at the impatience in her voice. He was chosen, even younger than I. Only eleven. 
Probably because at eleven he was more mature in a lot of ways than I was at thirteen. We were chosen the same year and almost the same month. He told me that Aradi chose him in the middle of the marketplace on fair day, and he kept trying to direct her attention to his sister because he thought he was too ugly to be a herald. Poor child. So, we went through the collegium as earmates. He saw how lonely I was there and how unused to dealing with other children, and decided that I needed a friend. And since I couldn't seem to make one by myself, he was going to do it for me. In classes, though, I had to help him along, and he was never better than average. It was pretty well accepted by all of us that after our internships, he was going to work border sectors, and I was going to teach. Then we found out how our gifts dovetailed, and how incredibly well we worked together, and everyone's plans were rather abruptly changed. And you began working as a team. Oh yes. And we discovered that we have a kind of gift for intrigue as well. The number of situations we've gotten ourselves into would astound you. Yet we always seem to extricate ourselves and come home covered in glory. Chris, what's he really like? Behind the jester mask, very sensitive. That's his heritage coming out. Endlessly kind to the helpless. You should see him sometime with a lap full of kittens or babies. Don't think he's soft and sentimental, though. I've seen him slit people's throats in cold blood when they deserved it, and do it from behind in the dark without a pretext of fair play. He says that if they're intending to do the same to him, it doesn't make sense to give them warning. He can be totally ruthless in the cause of queen, kingdom, and circle. Let's see what else is there. You've danced with him, so you know that his bumbling farmer look is totally deceiving. He's one of the few people that Albrick will accept to act as a substitute with his advanced pupils when Albrick is sick, and for all that, he's terribly vulnerable in certain areas. I helped him get over his broken heart, and I promise you, Talia, that I will personally break the neck of anyone who hurts him like that again. He was lying with his head turned to one side and pillowed on his arms. Talia could not help but see the fierce, cold hatred in his expression at that moment. Chris's fierce tone as he spoke the last few words was completely unfeigned. He remembered only too well what Dirk had been like then, broken, defeated. It had been horrible to compare what that bitch had made him into with what he had been before she'd worked her wiles on him. Dirk seldom shed a tear. But he had wept helplessly on Chris's shoulder when she'd ruined his life and his hopes for him. It was a thing he never wanted to witness again, and if he had any say about it, he never would. Then a painful thought occurred to him. He knew Dirk was more than interested in Talia, and she had been showing evidence of the same sort of feeling. But he and Talia had most of a year to go on her internship, and now that they were intimate, it was damned unlikely they'd go back to their earlier relationship. What the hell was he going to do if she started getting infatuated with him? It was more than a possibility, after all. Nearly every other female he'd spent any time with had ended up in the same state. He didn't want to think about it. I think it's time to do something about your problem, he said. Thinking that trouble might be less likely if he reasserted his position as a figure of authority, like what? She sat up slowly and shook her hair out of her eyes. Her expression in the flickering firelight a sober one. I'm going to take you absolutely back to basics, back to the very first thing they taught me. Shielden, hell no, girl. He replied, astounded. More basic than that, and if shielding. Was what they taught you first? Maybe that's one reason why you're having this problem. I'm taking you right back to the first steps, ground and center. She looked puzzled and shifted a little, curling her legs under her. Ground and what? Oh gods! He groaned. How the hell did you get away with? Of course, Ilsa must have thought you knew the basics. Maybe you did instinctively. He bit his lip. Thinking hard, staring off into the space beyond his internee, Talia just sat quietly, peering anxiously at him through the half dark of the station. Trouble is, as my teacher used to say, instinct is no substitute for conscious control. I, I guess I've rather well proved that, haven't I? She replied bitterly. Well, once instinct goes, there's no basis for reorganizing yourself. 
he took a deep breath, acutely aware of the faint smell of soap, straw, and animal that pervaded the station. Gods, she sighed and rubbed her temple with one hand. All right, do your worst. Don't laugh, he replied grimly. Before I'm through, it may well seem like just that. All right, are you comfortable, absolutely comfortable? She frowned, shifted a little, then nodded. He settled himself, folding his own legs under him, shifting until the straw under his blanket moved to a more comfortable place. Close your eyes. You can't sort out what's coming in at you unless you can recognize what's you and what isn't. That's what my teacher used to call the shape inside your skin. Find the place inside you that feels the most stable and work out from there. Feel everything. Then put what you felt away because you can recognize it as you. He was using what he called teaching voice with her, a kind of soothing monotone. She'd gone quite naturally into a half-trance, fairly well relaxed. By unfocusing his eyes and depending on sight rather than vision, he could see every move she made by the shifting energy patterns within her. Sight was a good gift to have for this situation, maybe better than her own would have been. By looking, not looking, in a peculiar sort of way that made his eyes feel strained, he could see energy fields and fluxes. What he saw was difficult to describe. It was something like seeing multiple images or ghosts of Talia, each one haloed in a different color. When he looked at the ungifted or gifted but untrained, the images didn't quite mesh and the edges were fuzzy and indistinct. In Talia's case, the edges were almost painfully sharp, and the images were given to flaring at unpredictable intervals, and they were so unconnected they almost seemed to belong to more than one person. If she could find her center, they would fuse into one. If she could ground, the flaring would stop. All right, once you've found that stable place, there's a similar place outside of you, in the earth itself. When you feel that, connect yourself to it. Finding the stable place is called centering. Connecting yourself to the earth is called grounding. He could tell, although his own gift wasn't anything like hers, that she had almost managed both actions. Almost, but not quite. The images were overlapping, but not fusing, and they dimmed and brightened and dimmed again. He could see that she was off balance and not connected, although to her it probably seemed as if she'd done exactly as he asked. Poor lady. He was about to do a very cruel thing to her. He sighed and signaled Tantris, who gave her a rude mental shove, a shove that translated into a very physical toppling over. Not good enough, he said coldly, as she stared up at him from where she was sprawled with a dazed expression on her face. If you'd done the thing properly, he wouldn't have been able to budge you. Again, ground and center. She tried, much shaken this time. If anything, she was worse off than before. Tantris hardly flicked her, and she lost internal balance. This time she did not lose physical control, although it was a near thing. She visibly swayed, as if beneath a blow. Ground and center, girl. This is a baby lesson. It ought to be reflex. Reflex, not instinct. Do it again. She was exhausted, sweat-drenched, knotted up all over, and shaking with the effort of holding back tears before he let up on her. There had been progress, though, and he told her so. You're not there yet, he said, but you're closer. You got a little closer to your true center each time you tried for it, except for the last time you missed it altogether. That's why we're quitting for a little. She buried her face in her hands, trembling all over. I think, she said after a moment, her voice muffled, that I could come to hate you with very little effort. So why don't you? he asked, masking his apprehension and the cold chill he felt at her words. She looked up at him and lowered her hands away from her face slowly. Because you're trying to help me, and this is the only way you know how. He let out the breath he'd been holding in a long sigh of relief. Lord of lights, 
he said thankfully. You would not believe how glad I am to hear you say that. Because if I did hate you, I could quite easily kill you. Exactly so. And all the easier while I was working with you, because I have to be completely unshielded to see what you're doing. She shuddered, and he moved forward to put his arms around her. She tensed for a moment, then relaxed into his shoulder. How much more of this? Until you get it right. Gods, and this is only the very beginning. Just the first steps. She bit back a sob of frustration. He felt it more than heard it, and ached for her. Anne said the cruelest thing yet. All right, you've had your wallow in self-pity. Now let's get back to work. And when she stared at him in disbelief, he snapped an order at her like any drill instructor. Ground and center, girl. Ground and center. When he finally let up on her, it was so late that he'd had to mend the fire twice. She was physically as well as emotionally drained. She crawled into bed and huddled among the blankets, too spent even to cry. He was almost as exhausted as she. He staggered over to the fire and banked it with painful precision, controlling the shaking of his hands with effort. You almost had it, he said finally. You came so close. I think you might have had it, if you'd just had the energy to get there. She lost the bleak emptiness that had been in her eyes. I, I thought maybe. Tomorrow we'll try something different. We'll try it in Link. Once you find your center, you won't lose it again. Gods, it is so frustrating watching you. I can see you coming close and missing, and I want to scream. Well, it's no festival from inside either, she retorted, then managed a wan smile. The least you can do after torturing me all night is to get in with me and keep me warm. Oh, I think I could manage something more personal than that, he replied, dredging up a smile of his own. Talia fell asleep almost immediately, every last bit of energy exhausted by the efforts of the day. Chris remained awake a bit longer, trying to figure how he was going to fit in the training with the all-too-necessary effort of digging out. Just before he finally slept, Tantris had the last word. Not one day, Tantris ordered. You're more tired than you thought. You rest tomorrow, too. I'm fine, Chris objected in a whisper. Huh, you only think you are. Wait until tomorrow. Besides, if you can get her centered, you'll be on the way to solving that problem. That takes precedence, I think. I hate to admit it, Chris yawned. But you're right, Featherfoot. Chris had not realized how truly bone-weary they were until he woke first the next day to discover that it was well past noon. He woke Talia, and they finished mending all the now dry garments, putting off the inevitable lesson as long as possible by mutual unspoken accord. Finally, it was she who said reluctantly, I suppose we'd better. Unfortunate, but true. Here. Here. He sat on the blankets of their bed and patted a place in front of him. I told you I was going to try a different tactic. You've linked in with me before, so you know what it's like. She seated herself cross-legged, their knees touching, and looked at him warily. I think I remember. Why? I'm going to try and show you your center. Now, just relax, and let me do the work this time. He waited until she had achieved that half-trance closed his own eyes long enough to trance down himself, then rested his hands lightly on her wrists. It was little more than a moment's work to bring her into rapport. That part of her gift was still working, almost too well. He opened his eyes slowly and looked, knowing she could see what he saw. She looked, gasped, and grabbed, throwing both of them out of trance and out of rapport. He had been expecting something of the sort and had been prepared for a fall. She had not been, and sat shaking her head to clear it afterward. That was a damn fool move, she said, when at last she could speak. I won't argue with that statement, he replied evenly. Ready to try again? She sighed, nodded, and settled herself once more. This time, she did not grab. She hardly moved at all. Finally, she broke the trance herself, unable to take the strain. It's like trying to draw by watching a mirror, 
she said through clenched teeth. So, he replied, giving her no encouragement to pity herself. So I try again. It was hours later when she met with victory. As Chris had suspected, when she centered properly, it was with a nearly audible snap, a great deal like having a dislocated joint pop back into place. There was a flare of energy and a flash of something almost like pain, followed by a flood of relief. Chris had Tantris nudge her, then shove her, with no effect. Ground, he ordered. She fumbled her way into a clumsy grounding with such an utter lack of finesse that his other suspicion, that she'd never done grounding and centering properly before, was pretty much confirmed. It was then that he realized that her shields hadn't just gone erratic. They'd collapsed. And the reason they'd collapsed was that they'd never been properly based in the first place. All right, he said quietly. Now you're properly set up. Can you see now why it's important? Because, she answered slowly, you have to have something to use as a base to build on? Right, he agreed. Now, come out of there. But you're going to find it yourself this time, without my help. Ground and center, Greenie. Ground and center. Damn it, that's not right. Do it again. Ground and center. Again and faster. Damn it, it should be reflex by now. Again. Talia held to her temper by the most tenuous of holds. If it hadn't been for the concern he was feeling, so overwhelming that she could sense it with no effort at all, she'd have lost her temper hours ago, ground and center over and over, faster and faster, with Tantris and Roland shoving at her when she least expected it. The first time they'd pushed her before she was properly settled, she'd literally been knocked out for a moment. She came to with Chris propping her up, expression impassive. Tantris hit me! she said indignantly. He was supposed to, Chris replied, letting her go. But I wasn't ready. It wasn't fair. She stared at him, losing the tenuous hold she'd had on her emotions. It felt like betrayal. It felt horribly like betrayal. Damn right it wasn't fair. He answered the anger and hurt in her voice with cool contempt. Life isn't fair. You learned that a long time ago. He felt the anger then. Hers. It couldn't be coming from anywhere else, since beneath his veneer of contempt, he was worried and no little frightened. He was taking his life in his hands by provoking her and was all too conscious of the fact. Damn it, you're leaking again. Lock it down. The anger died. She flushed with shame. He didn't give her a chance to get back into the cycle of doubt and self-pity. Now, ground and center, and get centered before they can knock you over. He didn't even let her stop when they ate, snapping at her to center at unexpected moments, letting Tantris or Roland judge when she was most off guard and choosing then to push at her. It wasn't until he was exhausted, so exhausted he couldn't properly see any more, that he called it quits for the night. She undressed for bed in total silence, so barricaded that there was nothing to read in her face or eyes. He waited for her to say something, waited in vain. I'm not sorry, he said finally. I know it's not your fault. You got out of Gray's half-trained, but I'm not sorry I'm doing this to you. If you don't learn this the hard way, you won't learn it right. I know that, she replied, looking up at him sharply, and I'm not angry at you. Not now, anyway. I'm mostly tired and God's my head hurts so I can hardly think. He relaxed and reached for the container of willow bark on the mantelpiece, handing it to her with a rueful smile. In that case, I can assume it's safe to come to bed. I wouldn't murder you there anyway, she replied with a hint of her old sense of humor. It would get the blankets all sticky. He laughed and settled himself, watching her make herself a cup of herbal tea for her headache. Before today he hadn't been sure, but now... He dared to believe she would tame that wild gift of hers. It wouldn't be too much longer before centering would be reflex. Then it was only a matter of time to build back what she'd lost. Chris, are you still awake? Sort of, he answered drowsily, lulled by the warmth and his own weariness. I just want to say that I appreciate this. At least, 
I do when you're not pounding on me. He chuckled, but made no other reply. I need you, Chris, she finished softly. That's something I don't forget, even when I'm angriest. I really need you. It took a while for the sense of that to penetrate. And when it did, it almost shocked him awake again, if he hadn't been so tired. As it was, guilt followed him down into sleep. She needed him. Good gods, what if it was something more than need? Talia waited until Chris's deep and even breathing told her he really had fallen asleep and carefully extricated herself from the bed without waking him. She always thought better with some task in her hands, a holdover from her childhood, so she took her cup of willow bark tea and set about polishing some of the bright bits of metalwork on Roland's tack. The cloak she'd wrapped around herself kept the chill off her back, and the fire in front of her gave off just enough heat to be pleasant. Thusly settled in, she put her mind to the myriad problems at hand. The fire crackled cheerfully. She wished she could feel cheerful. Lord and lady, what an unholy mess she'd gotten into. The storm alone would have been bad enough. Any of the problems would have been bad enough to have to deal with all of them together. At least she'd made a start, some kind of start, on getting herself retrained. Chris seemed happier after this afternoon's work. He had been right about one thing. Now that she knew what being centered felt like, she'd never lose the ability to find that firm base again. She'd wanted to kill him this afternoon, and more than once. But she was learning in a way that would make her stronger, and now that she was calmer, she could appreciate that. She needed him, more than she'd ever needed anyone else. But Lord and Lady, what if it was something more complicated than need, or even need and the kind of feeling she had for Skiff. He was handsome, handsome as an angel, and despite a certain smug vanity, a man she'd be more than proud to have as a friend. Look at the way he was taking his life in his hands, literally, for the sake of getting her back in control of herself and her gift. He was kind, he was gentle, he was considerate, and with the way her mind had been playing tricks on her lately, it was more than a possibility that she'd unconsciously used her gift to influence the way he thought about her, even to the point of getting him into bed with her. Lady knew she was no beauty, and if she had influenced him in that, she could have caused an even deeper attraction. She clenched her hands on her mug so hard they ached. That was one thing she had not wanted. At least not originally. But now? She liked Chris well enough. Well enough, but not that well. She was attracted to Dirk. There was no question about that. And strongly. More strongly than she'd ever felt about anyone. It was almost, she decided a bit reluctantly, as if Dirk was some hitherto unrecognized, hitherto unmissed other half of herself, and that she'd never again feel whole after having met him unless... Unless what... Heralds seldom made any kind of long-term commitment, contenting themselves with the close friendship of the circle, casual, strictly physical liaisons, and the bonds of their companions. And truly few heralds she knew were at all dissatisfied with that kind of life. Realistically speaking, the job was far too dangerous to make a life bond possible or desirable. Look what had happened to Karen when Ilsa died. If Cheryl hadn't had exactly what she needed and been right on the spot, she might very well have death-willed herself in bereavement. And she'd only seen Dirk a handful of times. But for Harold, sometimes only once was enough. Her mind drifted back years. It was late one night that they'd all been gathered in Karen's room over hot mulled wine and sometimes ribbled conversation. Somehow the subject turned from body jokes to the truth behind some of the legends and tales told by outsiders about heralds. They were laughing at some of the more absurd exaggerations. Take that love at one glance nonsense, <laughs> Talia had giggled. Someone ought to really take the bards to task over that one. How could anyone know from the first meeting that someone they've just met will be a life partner? Oddly enough, that's not an exaggeration. Cheryl had replied soberly. When it happens with heralds, that's generally exactly the way it happens. It's almost as if there was something, something even deeper than instinct that recognizes the other soul. She shrugged. Metaphysical, 
sentimental, but still true. Do you mean to tell me that both of you had that happen? Talia had been incredulous. As a matter of fact, the very first time I set eyes on Karen, Cheryl replied, notwithstanding the fact that I was just under fourteen at the time. Karen nodded. Ilsa and I knew when we met midway through our third year. Until then, we'd never done more than wave at each other across the room since we had had very different schedules. We did wait, though, until we were both sure that it was something solid and not ephemeral, and until we'd completed our internships before committing to each other. And I didn't want to intrude on what was obviously a life bond. You would have been welcome. To tell you the truth, we'd wondered a little. But I didn't know that at the time, did I? Cheryl had laughed. Truly, though, Talia, anyone I've ever talked to that has seen a life bond has said the same thing. That was the way it was for Selene's parents, for instance. It either happens the first time you meet or never. And if it's not a life bond, there's nothing you can do to make it one, to make it more than a temporary relationship, no matter how much you want it to be something more. Karen had continued. My twin found that out. Talia must have looked intensely curious. Although she hadn't actually asked anything, because Karen continued after a moment. Remember, I've told you once or twice that I've got a niece and nephew almost your age. Well, they're Terrans. Not only were we not chosen at the same time, but it took seven years for his companion to come for him. By then, I was a field herald, and he was married and working the sponge boat. Then it happened; he was chosen, and the wife he had thought he was contented with turned out to mean less to him than he'd ever dreamed. He wanted to love her; he really did. And he tried to make himself love her. It didn't work. He went through an incredible amount of soul searching and guilt before concluding that the emotion wasn't there and wasn't going to be, and that his real life was with the circle and his companion. And to tell the truth, his wife, now ex-wife, didn't really seem to care. His children were adopted into our family, and she turned around and married into another with no sign of regret that I could see. So you see. She had concluded, "If you're a herald, you either have a life bond and recognize it at once, or you live your life without one." Talia sighed. If she were going to be honest with herself, she had to admit that this seemed to be exactly what had happened to her with regard to Dirk. Seemed to be that was the key. How did she know that this wasn't some fantasy she was building in her own mind? It didn't feel much like a fantasy, though. It was more like a toothache. Or perhaps the way Jadis had felt about his missing leg, he'd said it had often seemed as if it were still there and aching. Well, there was something in Talia that ached too. Fine. What about Chris? What she felt for Chris just wasn't that deep. Yes, she needed him, his support, his expertise, his encouragement, but need was just not the same as love. Or rather, the emotion she felt for him was a different kind of love. A comradeship, actually closer to what she felt for Roland or Skiff or even Karen than anything else. But if Chris had become infatuated with her, gods, it almost didn't bear thinking about. Granted, he certainly wasn't acting very lover-like, and earlier he almost seemed to be throwing Dirk at her. Outside of bed, he was treating her more like Albrecht treated a trainee who had gotten some bad early lessoning and needed to have it beaten out of him, except in the digging out. When he treated her as an absolute equal, neither cosseting her nor allowing her to take more than her share of the work, provided her mind hadn't been tricking both of them, which was a very real possibility. Oh, hellfire! She sighed. At least she'd managed to clarify some of her feelings, and there wasn't anything she could do about it anyway. Not until she had her gift under full control and could sort out what was real and what wasn't. She drank the last of the stone cold tea and put up the harness, then slipped back into bed. Right now, the only thing to do was to enforce the sleep she knew she needed badly. It was best to just try and take things a day at a time, because at this point, she had more pressing problems to deal with. If she couldn't get her gift back under control, this would all be very moot. For she was quite well aware of how close she'd come to driving both Chris and herself over the edge. It could happen again, especially if he did something to badly frighten her. And if it did, if it did, it could end only too easily, in his death, hers, or both.
Chapter 10 Well, there was one way, Talia knew, to keep herself under control, and that was to work herself into a state of total exhaustion. So in the morning she rose early, almost before the sun, and she began pressing herself to her limits, making each day blur into the next in a haze of fatigue. It became impossible to tell what day it was, or even how long they'd been there. Talia usually woke first, at dawn, and would prod Chris into wakefulness. One or the other of them would prepare not only breakfast, but unleavened cakes with some form of soup or stew, something that could remain untended most of the day without scorching, simply because they both knew that, by the time they came in, they would have barely enough energy to eat and perform a sketchy sort of wash before collapsing into bed. After a hearty breakfast of fruit and porridge, she would wrap the companion's legs against the sharp edges of the ice crust while Chris haltered the churras, and all six occupants of the station would troop out into the cold to begin the day's work. Roland and Tantris would move up first and break the crust of ice and the hard snow beneath by rearing to their full heights and crashing down on it with their forelegs, or backing up to it and kicking as hard as they could. They would move back, and Talia and Chris would then take their places, picking up the chunks that had broken off and heaving them to either side of the trail they were cutting. The churras would use their powerful foreclaws on what remained, until they were halted by snow too packed for them to dig, or crust too slippery to get a grip on. Then the heralds would move the chunks they'd dislodged, scoop up the loose snow, and let the companions take over again. They would work without a break until the sun reached its zenith, then take begrudged time for a hasty lunch. On their return, they would work until darkness. Each day the trips to and from the station got longer. Sometimes it was only that which kept Talia working. There were times, too many times, when their progress was limited to a few feet for a whole day of backbreaking labor, and she knew the station itself was furlongs from the road. It was when their measured progress amounted to little more than a dozen paces that the temptation to give up was the strongest. When darkness fell, Chris would tend the companions while Talia groomed the churras, checking them thoroughly for any sign of injury or muscle strain during the process of grooming them. Roland and Tantris, of course, could be relied upon to tell their chosen if they'd been hurt, but the churras were another story and if one of the churras had to drop out of the work, their progress would be halved. Finally, Chris or Talia, usually Talia, would ensure that everyone was well supplied with food and water and blanketed against the night chill before they wolfed down their own dinners and sought their bed. It was the hardest physical labor either of them had ever performed. The constant cold seeped into their very bones, and their muscles never stopped aching. It wore them down, a little more each day. They had strictly rationed their own supplies, and the food they were taking in was not equaling the energy they were expending. They were getting thinner, both of them, and tougher, physically. It was a change Talia hardly noticed because it was so gradual, but once in a while she would think vaguely that her friends would have been surprised to the point of shock by the way she looked. Chris continued to hammer at her through the first week of digging out until centering and grounding had become reflexive. After that, he left her in peace, only offering an occasional bit of weary advice. Talia's control over empathic projection came and went, at unpredictable intervals, although Chris evidently never noticed her projecting involuntarily. If he had, he would have pounced on her. Of that, she was certain." Her shielding was returning now that she had something to form a firm base for it, but it was the thinnest of veils, hardly even enough to know that it was there. She worked at control with nearly the same single-minded obsession she was giving the physical labor of digging out. The only pauses in their routine were the two occasions when they again ran out of clean clothing. Those two days were given over to a repeat of their wash day, and to brave attempts to revive one another's faltering spirits. As tired as Talia was, it was easy to become depressed. 
Chris wasn't quite so much the pawn of his emotions, but there were times Talia found herself having to pull him out of despair. The endless cold did not help matters any, nor did the fact that they had indeed needed to cut green wood to use in their fire. The green wood, even when mixed with seasoned, gave off much less heat. Talia felt as if she'd never be warm again. But one afternoon, nearly a month from the time they'd first reached the station, she looked up from their task in sudden bewilderment to realize that they'd finally reached the road. And the road was as drift-covered as the path out had been. Now what? Talia asked dully. Oh, gods. Chris sat down on a chunk of snow with none of his usual grace. This was a scenario he'd never contemplated. He'd always assumed that once they broke out, the main road would be cleared as well. He stared at the icy wilderness in front of them and tried to think. The storm. It must have spread farther than I thought, he said at last. The road crews should have been within sensing distance by now otherwise. He felt utterly bewildered and profoundly shaken, for once at a total loss for a course of action. He just gazed numbly at the unbroken expanse of snow covering the road, unable to even think clearly. Talia tried to clear her mind, to stay calm, but the uncanny silence echoed in her ears, and that feeling of someone watching was back. She glanced apprehensively at Chris, wondering if he was sensing the same thing she was, and in the next breath, certain it was all originating in her mind. The feeling of being watched was, if anything, more intense than it had been before, and ever so slightly ominous. It was very much akin to the uneasy queasiness she used to have whenever Keldar would stand over her at some chore, waiting and watching for her to make the tiniest mistake. Something out there was unsure of her, mistrusted her, and was waiting for her to slip somehow. And when she did, panic rose in her and choked off the words she had intended. Chris stared at the unbroken ice crust as if entranced, unable to muster enough energy to say anything more. Gradually, though, he became aware of a feeling of uneasiness, exactly as if someone were watching him from under cover of the brush beneath the snow-laden trees. He tried to dismiss the feeling, but it continued to grow, until it was only by sheer force of will that he was able to keep from whipping around to see who was staring at the back of his neck. It wasn't entirely an unfriendly regard, but it was a wary one, as if whatever it was that was watching him wasn't quite sure of him. He tried to shield to clear his mind of the strange sensations, only to have them intensify when he invoked shielding. And now he was seeing and hearing things as well, slight forms that could only be caught out by the corner of his eye and slipped into invisibility when he tried to look at them directly. And there seemed to be sibilant whisperings just on the edges of his hearing, all of which could well be from a single source. Talia had told him once already that she thought she was hallucinating, she could well be drawing him into an irrational little nightmare world of her making. Talia, he snapped angrily, more than a little frightened. Lock it down! And he whipped around to glare at her, enraged, and just about ready to strike out at her for her lack of control. Talia forgot the strange watcher, forgot everything except Chris's angry and untrue accusation. She flushed, then paled, then reacted. It's not me! she snapped. Then, when he continued to stare at her with utter disbelief, she lost the control she had been holding to with her psychic teeth and toenails. This time, at least, the companions were prepared and shielded themselves quickly. Chris, however, got the full brunt of her fear of the situation and her anger at him. He rose involuntarily to his feet and staggered back five or six paces to trip and fall backward into the hard snow, his face as white as hers and unable to do more than raise his arms in front of his face in a futile gesture of warding. And the watcher stirred. Talia froze. The feeling that some power was uncoiling and contemplating striking her down was so powerful that she was unable even to breathe. 
Somehow she cut off the emotion storm, and, simultaneous with her resumption of control, Roland paced forward slowly to stand beside her. He faced not her but the watching forest, his whole posture a silent challenge. There was a feeling of vague surprise, and the sensation of being watched vanished. Talia felt released from her paralysis and wanted to die of shame for what she'd nearly done to Chris. As he blinked in surprise, she turned blindly away from him, leaned against a tree trunk and wept, her face buried in her arms. Chris stumbled to his feet and put both arms around her. Talia, little bird, please don't, he begged. I'm sorry. I didn't mean... I lost my temper. It'll be all right. It's got to be all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But dreary days of grinding labor and nights of too little rest had taken their toll of his spirit as well. It was only when the tears started to freeze on both their faces that they were able to stop sobbing in dejection and despair. It, that thing watching, she shook with more than cold. I don't want to talk about it she said, looking uneasily over her shoulder. Not here. Not now. It wasn't you. No, I swear on my life. He believed her. All right. Let's handle what we've got. The storm was worse than we thought, he said, getting control of himself again. This is the very northernmost end of the road. They can't be more than a few days away, and we aren't running short of food yet. We'll be all right, especially if we start rationing ourselves. We won't need as much food if we rest, Talia said, drying her eyes on the gauze she'd used to protect them from sun glare. And we can plant a signal so that they know we're here. I can get the cross to hold me a good distance, and you're lighter than I am. About an hour's scramble will do. Wait here. He mounted Tantris, and the two of them headed back to the station, vanishing from sight down the narrow little valley they'd cut. Talia waited for their return, occasionally looking warily over her shoulder. Whatever had been watching her had been within a hair of striking her. Why she was certain of this she had no idea, but she could not rid herself of the thought. She had no idea of what had deterred it, but she did not want it to catch her unaware. She clung to Roland's neck and waited exerting every bit of control she had. For it seemed to her that the Watcher had only acted when it appeared that she was attacking Chris. If that was the case, she had no intention of inadvertently invoking it again. It was at least a candle mark, and far too long for her peace of mind, before she saw Chris and Tantras trotting back. He carried four white arrows, two long branches, and some bright blue rags. These will show up at a distance. Here, pat on these, will you? He dismounted and handed her two of the arrows and began working on his two. We tie the arrows to the stick and plant the stick out in the middle of where the road is. When the crews find them, they'll know we're here and still alive. They'll even know for certain it's us if they happen to have a herald with them. Surely anyone with them will have been given our patterns. Why are we doing this? If we don't, they might not clear the road this far. This is just the northernmost loop. It isn't strictly needed to get between Waymeet and Berry Bay. It takes longer to go around than to cut through sorrows, but nobody travels much in the winter except heralds, and nobody knows where we've been lost. He handed her one of his arrows in exchange for hers. Both of them tied the arrows to one of the branches and made them as conspicuous as possible with fluttering rags. You go toward Waymeet. I'll go toward Berry Bay, he said, preparing to climb up on the snow crust. Plant yours at the first crossroads you come to. I'll do the same. Hopefully the road crews will find one of them before they give up. Chris, what if it snows again? Talia, for the love of the goddess, don't even think that. Walk as far as you can, but be back here by dusk. Talia had never felt so lonely. There was scarcely a sound from the white woods on either side. She could hear the creaking sounds of Chris carefully making his way across the snow crust behind her, sliding his feet so as not to break it. Even so, 
She heard the crunch that meant he'd fallen through at least once before he got too far away for the sounds to carry to her. It was a measure of his own dejection that he didn't even have the spirit to swear. She set out herself, often having to detour around high drifts that she didn't dare try and climb. Her eyes ached from tears and snow glare, and she was as tired as she'd ever been in her life. She was grateful that she was lighter than Chris. The snow crust was holding beneath her without any such mishaps as he had had. The silence was eerie, frightening. As frightening in its way as the howl of the storm had been, Talia was shivering long before she reached her turnaround point, and not just from cold. There were no sounds of birds or animals, no indication that anything else lived and moved here besides herself. That horrible feeling of something watching might be gone, but there was still something uncanny about the Forest of Sorrows, something touched with the chill of death and the ice of despair. Whatever power held sway here, it was unsleeping and brooding. She knew it beyond doubt, and somehow knew she was feeling only the barest touch of its power. And she didn't really want to trust to the supposed protection of her whites by venturing too far alone. She was more than relieved to find a half-buried crossroad sign. That meant she could plant her gaudy staff in the snow crust at the peak of a drift and retrace her steps. She was never so glad to see another human being as she was to see Chris picking his way across the snow, coming toward her. Back in the station, Talia surveyed what was left of their supplies. They'd better come soon, she said, trying to keep doubt out of her voice. Even if we're careful, we don't have much. It'll probably last for a week, but not much more. If they're as worried as I think, as I hope... They'll be working around the clock, even by torchlight, Chris said, sheer exhaustion making his voice toneless. It just can't be too much longer. They may not recognize us as heralds at all, she replied, trying to joke a little. I doubt they've ever seen heralds looking so shabby. I've had to practically rub holes in my things to get them white again. Our appearance is hardly going to enhance the heraldic image. She screwed up her face in imitation of an old man's grimace and croaked, Heralds? You'll be not heralds. You'll be imposters for certain sure. Gypsies, scalawags, and where got ye them whitewashed nags, eh? Heh? Chris just stared at her for a long moment, then suddenly began to laugh as helplessly as he'd wept earlier. Perhaps it was their weariness that made them as prone to near hysterical hilarity as to tears. Talia began to giggle herself, then crow with laughter. They collapsed into their bed nest together, legs too weak to stand up, and for a long time could hardly stop laughing long enough to breathe. No sooner would one of them get himself under control and the other start to follow suit when one look would set them both off again. Enough, please, Chris gasped at last. Then don't keep looking at me, Talia replied resolutely staring at a stain on her boots until she got her breath back. Berry Bay has a resupply station, Chris said, doing his best to maintain a serious subject. We can get new uniforms there, and we can get our leathers bleached and retreated. I'll warn you, though, the sizes will only be approximate. Just so that the whites are white and not gray or full of holes. I don't suppose you know enough sewing to alter what we've got, Chris asked wistfully. She could tell by his expression that his fastidious nature was mildly disturbed by the notion that he would be looking considerably less than immaculate in outsize uniforms. Talia raised an eyebrow in his direction. My dear Harold, I'll have you know that by my third year at the Collegium, I was making whites. I may very well have made some of your wardrobe. Strange thought. He pulled off his boots, slowly. It... it wasn't you playing tricks on my mind? No, she replied. Not until you shouted at me. Gods. I think I must be going mad. She was rubbing at her white, cold feet, trying to restore circulation. Don't, please. It's the isolation, the worry, she responded with a clutching of fear in her chest. Not enough rest, 
Not enough food? Are making me see things? Are you seeing things? No, she admitted. But it seems like the forest is watching. Almost all the time. Chris started. Talia saw him jump and bit her lip. It's nothing, he said. Just, Tantra says you're right. He says the forest is watching us. Damn it. I thought it was you doing things to me. Sorry. Chris, I lost it again. Tears stung her eyes. Hey, not as bad as last time. And you got control back by yourself, right? Sort of. Whatever it was, when I turned on you, it suddenly felt like it was going to do something to me if I touched you. That was when I got scared back into sense. And you got control back. However it happened, you got control back. Don't give up on me, little bird. And don't give up on yourself either. I'll try, she said, a faint tremor in her voice. I'll try. Leaden silence hung between them until he took it upon himself to break it. Jadis left you his harp, so I assume that you know how to play it, but I've never once heard you do so, would you? I'm nowhere near as good as you are, she protested. Humor me, he insisted. All right, but you may be sorry. She curled into the blankets to try and keep a little warmth in her legs and back and took the harp from him when he brought it from its corner. This was the first time she'd played in front of anyone but Jadis. The way the firelight caught the golden grain of the wood brought back those days with a poignant sadness. She rested her hands on the strings for a moment, then began playing the first thing that came to memory. The song was Sun and Shadow, and Chris was very much aware from the first few notes that she performed it quite differently than he did where he and Dirk emphasized the optimistic foreshadowing of the ultimate solution to the lover's trials and made the piece almost hopeful in spite of its somber quality. She wandered the lonely paths of the song's present, where their respective curses seemed to be dooming the pair to live forever just out of one another's reach. She was correct in insisting that she wasn't as technically adept a player as Chris, but she played as she sang, with feeling, feeling that she made you hear. In her hands, sun and shadow could tear your heart. The last notes hung in the air between them for long moments before he could clear his throat enough to say something. I keep telling you, he managed at last, that you underestimate yourself. You're a remarkably uncritical audience, she replied. Would you like her back, or shall I murder something else? I'd like you to play more if you would. She shrugged, but secretly was rather pleased that he hadn't reclaimed my lady. Her mood was melancholy, and it was possible to find solitude by losing herself in the music. Solitude that it wasn't possible to create when he was playing or she was singing. She continued, closing her eyes and letting her hands wander through whatever came to mind, sometimes singing, Sometimes not. Chris listened quietly, without comment. The few times she looked up, his face was so shadowed that she couldn't read his expression. Eventually she ran out of music fitting her mood, and her hands fell silent from the harp strings. That's all I know, she said into the silence that followed. Then that, he replied, taking the harp from her, is enough for one night. I think it is more than time enough for bed. She had doubted she'd be able to sleep, but the moment she relaxed, she was lost to slumber. Three days later, the station seemed to have shrunk around them and felt very confining, especially to Talia, who had always had a touch of claustrophobia. Her temper was shortened to near non-existence, and she feared losing it, greatly feared it. Cress, she said, when his pacing became too much for her to bear. Will you go out? Will you please go somewhere? He stopped in mid-step and turned to eye her with speculation. Am I driving you out of patience? It's more than that. It's that feeling of being watched. Is it back? She sagged with relief. You feel it too? Not now. I did a little while back. 
Um, I send him both of us mad? She clenched her hands so hard that her nails left marks in her palms. He sat on the floor at her feet, took her hands in his, and made her relax them. I don't think so. If you'll remember, Tantris told me that the forest was watching us. What is it? I only have a guess. It's Vanya's curse. It's made the whole forest aware somehow. I don't think it likes me, she said, biting her lip. Chris had the listening look he wore when Tantris mind spoke him. Tantris says he thinks it's disturbed by you. You're a herald, but you're a danger to me, another herald. It isn't sure what to do with you. So as long as I stay in control, it will leave me alone. I would surmise. He rose to his feet. And to keep you from losing control, I am going out. Chris had decided to flounder his way down the road toward Waymeet, in hopes of meeting with a road crew. He entered the station to have an entirely unexpected and mouth-watering aroma hit him full in the face. I'm hallucinating, he said, half afraid that once again he really was. I'm smelling fresh meat cooking. Pretty substantial hallucinations, then, since you're going to have them for supper, Talia replied with a sober face. Then, unable to restrain herself, she jumped up from the hearth to throw her arms around him in a joyful hug. Two squirrels and a rabbit, Chris. I got them all, and there'll be more. The footer is attracting them. I didn't even lose or break any arrows. Bright havens, he said, sitting down with a thump, hardly daring to believe it. There was no denying the stewed meat and broth Talia ladled out to him, however. They ate every scrap, the first fresh food they'd had in weeks, sucking the tiny bones dry, then celebrated with exuberant loving. They fell asleep with untroubled hearts for the first time in many days. They were awakened the next morning very early. The churras were stirring restlessly, and both companions seemed to be listening to something. Roland was overwhelmingly relieved and joyful, and Talia went deeper to find out why. Tantris says, Chris began, There are people coming, Talia finished excitedly. Chris, it's the road crew. There's a herald with them, too. Tantris thinks they'll reach us sometime afternoon. Have they reached our marker yet? Yes. The herald had his companion broadcast a mind call to Oz when he found it. I might even have met them yesterday if I hadn't gone in the wrong direction, idiot that I am. How were you to know? How many are there? Ten, not counting the herald. Should we go out and try to dig the path out farther to meet them? No, Chris said firmly. The little we can do won't make much difference, and I'm still tired. We'll pack up, straighten things up here, and meet them where the path meets the road. It seemed strange to see the station barren of their belongings, with only the empty containers that the supplies had been stored in to tell of their presence there this past month. It took longer than Talia had thought it would to repack everything. They did not leave the station until almost noon. When they reached the road, they could see the newcomers in the far distance. They waved and shouted, and could tell by the agitated movements of the other figures that they'd been spotted. The work crew redoubled their efforts, and before too long, though not soon enough for Talia and Chris, the paths met. Heralds, Talia and Chris! The white-clad figure that was first through the gap was unfamiliar to both of them, though his immaculate uniform made them uncomfortably conscious of the pitiful condition of their own. Yes, Harold, Chris answered for both of them. Praise the lady! When the guard learned that you hadn't stayed at Waymeet and hadn't arrived at Berry Bay, and that you'd left on the very eve of the storm, we all feared the worst. Had you been caught in it, I doubt you would have survived even one night. This was the worst blizzard in these parts in recorded history. Oh, I'm Tedrick. How on earth did you manage? We were warned by our churras in time to make the way station, but I doubt that we'd be in any shape to greet you now if it hadn't been stalked by someone other than the regular resupply crew, Chris replied. Whoever it was, he seems to have had an uncannily accurate idea of how much provender we'd need and what kinds. That's the way their witch is doing, said one of the work crew, a stolid-looking farmer.
kept at us this fall till we got it stocked to our liking, even made us go back after first snow with some odd bits, honey and oil, salted meat and fish. We had it to spare, praise Kernos, and she's never yet been wrong when she gets one of these notions, so we went along with it. Happen, it was a good thing. Praise Kernos in very deed. I see, you've got your gear. Come along with me and I'll have you warm and dry and fed before nightfall. I'm with the resupply station outside of Berry Bay. I've got plenty of room for both of you, if you don't mind sharing a bed. Not at all, Chris replied gravely, sensing Talia struggling with the effort of maintaining what little shielding she had against the pressure of fifteen mines. We've been sleeping on straw next to the hearth for warmth. Right now a camp cot would sound like heaven, even if I had to share it with Tantras. Good, excellent, Harold Tedrick replied. I'll guide you both back. These good people know what they're doing, and they certainly don't need me in the way now that they've found you. The members of the work crew made polite noises, but they obviously agreed with him. Fact is, Harold, the red-faced farmer whispered to Chris. Old Tedrick's a good enough sort, but he don't belong out here. He's too old, and his heart's more than a mite touchy. Way station supply post was supposed to be a pension and out position, if you catch my meaning. He ain't the kind to sit idle, even though he hasn't the health to ride circuit no more. We're supposed to be keeping an eye on him, make sure he don't overdo. Job set up so's he could feel useful, but wouldn't have to do anything straining. Guard's supposed to do all his fetching and carrying for him. But what with this storm and all, guards busy clearing the roads, seeing to the emergencies. When he found out you two was messing, nothing would do but that ego out with us. Gave us a real fright a time or two, getting short of breath and blue like when we thought we might have found bodies. Good thing you turned up all right, or I reckon we'd have had a third body on our hands. This put things in an altogether different light. Chris felt a sudden increase in respect for the talkative and seemingly feckless Harold. On closer examination, he saw that Tedrick was a great deal older than he had first appeared, partially because he was bald as an egg, and partially because he had a kind of baby-soft face that tends not to wrinkle with age. His companion cosseted him tenderly, flatly refusing to race headlong down the road so that he could prepare the station for his guests. Talia and Chris took turns telling him what had transpired from the time they discovered the plague in Waymeet. So, you're the Queen's own, the one with the gift for emotions and mind healing, he asked Talia, peering at her short-sightedly. She could sense his faint unease around her, even through the shields Roland was holding, and mentally shrank into herself. I wonder if you could do something for the Weather Witch. Considering that we obviously owe our lives, I'll certainly be glad to try, Talia replied, trying not to show her own unease and her real dismay at being asked to use her wayward gift. Just who is she, and why do you call her the Weather Witch? Ah, it's a sad story, that, he sighed. A few years ago, it would be when I'd only just been assigned this post— there was a young woman named Maven in Berry Bay who'd gone and had herself a festival child. That's a babe that no one will claim and whose mother hasn't the faintest notion who the father might be. People being what they are, there was a certain amount of tisking and finger-pointing until the poor girl heartily wished the babe had never been conceived, much less born. That's what made what happened to her all the worse, you see. You know, be careful what you ask for. You might get it. I'm sure she often wished the child gone, and when the accident happened, she blamed herself. She was taking her turn working at the mill, and she left the little one alone for longer than she should have. Poor Mite was just beginning to crawl about, and it managed to wriggle free of the basket she'd left it in. It crawled straight to the mill race, fell in and drowned. She was the one to find the body, and she went quite mad. But why Weather Witch? Chris asked. She must have had a gift, and her going off her head freed it altogether because she started being able to predict the weather. She'd be acting just as usual, dandling that rag doll she got in place of a babe, 
Then out of nowhere, she'd look straight through you and tell you that you'd better see that the beans got taken in because it was going to hail that night. Then, sure enough, it would. People in Berry Bay and for a bit around took to coming to her any time the weather looked uncertain. She began to be able to see the weather that was coming days, then weeks, then months in advance. That's why the villagers heeded her when she told them to stock the station. I wish they'd told me. I'd have laid in a good deal more on my own. You stocked it very well, and we've nothing to find fault with, Chris replied reassuringly. I'm afraid, though, that you'll find we've used up just about everything that was there. That will be no problem, Tedrick said cheerfully. I'll be glad to have a little task to turn my hand to. Most of my work's done in the summer, and winter's a bit of a slow time for me. But it looks to me as if you could use a full resupply yourselves. I'm afraid so, Talia said as Tedrick shook his head over the state of their uniforms. I don't think the fabric is going to be good for much except rugs. I've got plenty of stock back at the station, and I'm no bad hand with a needle, Tedrick replied. I think I can refit you well enough so that you won't be looking like crow scares. I've got all the necessaries for bleaching and refinishing your leathers, so we won't have to replace those. And your cloaks still look in fairly good shape, or will be after we clean them. If you don't mind staying a bit, I can turn you out looking almost like the day you left to take this sector. That sounds fantastic, Chris said with obvious thankfulness. I can help with the altering, sir, Talia added. The old herald twinkled at her. But who tailors the tailor, then? And surely you wouldn't deny an old man the pleasure of helping fit a pretty young lady, would you? Talia blushed, and to cover it, settled my lady wrapped in her blankets in a new position on her lap. Without the harp case to protect her, Talia elected to carry her personally. What's this? Tedrick asked, and brightened to learn it was a harp. Which of you is the musician? He asked eagerly. We both are, sir, Chris replied. But he really plays a great deal better than I do, Talia added. And Harold Tedrick, we truly appreciate it if you could find someone to make a new traveling case for her while we're here. We had to destroy the old one to make snow shovels. The cabinet maker would be proud to oblige you, Tedrick said with certainty. In fact, he may even have something already made that will fit. Midwinter fares at the sector capital in a few weeks, and he's been readying a few instrument cases to take there, as well as his little carved boxes and similar trumperies. He's known for his work on small pieces as well as furniture, you see. I'll make a note to start stocking shovels in our stations from now on. Not every herald has harp cases to sacrifice. They passed the village of Berry Bay just before sunset. Talia, finding herself grateful for the shielding Roland was supplying her, and reached the resupply station with the coming of the dark. The place was much larger than Talia had expected. Great heavens, she exclaimed. You could house half the collegium here. Oh, most of it isn't living quarters. It's mostly hay barn, warehouse, and granary. I do have three extra rooms in case some need should bring a number of heralds as far north, but... Only one of those rooms has a bed. Any more than two would have to make up beds on the floor. But let's take first things first. I expect you'd both appreciate a hot bath. It will pleasure both of you to know I have a real bathing room, just like the ones at the palace and collegium. While you're getting washed, I'll find some clean clothing for you to wear until we get your new outfits altered and your leathers cleaned. As soon as you're feeling ready, there'll be supper. How does that strike you? It sounds wonderful. Especially the part about the hot bath, Talia replied fervently as they dismounted in the station stable. Then take yourselves right in that door over there. I'll tend to your beasts and friends. Go up the staircase, then take a sharp right. The coppers all fired up. I've been doing it every day on the chance that we'd find you. The room you'll be using is sharp left. They each took a small pack, and Talia took her harp and entered the door he'd indicated. Tedrick hadn't exaggerated. Though it only held a single bed, the bathing room was identical in every other way to the ones at the palace. Which of us goes first? Talia asked, thinking longingly of clean hair and a good long soak. You. You look ready to die, Chris replied. 
I'm feeling the strain a bit, she admitted. Then get your bath. I can wait. When tight muscles were finally relaxed and the grime that had accumulated despite her best efforts ruthlessly scrubbed away, she wrapped herself with towels and sought their room. She found that Tedrick had preceded them there. On the bed were laid out fabric breeches and shirts of something approximating their sizes. The approximation was far from exact. It was obvious that if these articles were representative of the kinds of clothing held in storage, there was a great deal of work that was going to have to be done. She stretched out on the bed for just a moment, only to fall completely asleep. Chris had taken himself downstairs again to talk in private with Tedrick. He hadn't missed the older man's initial unease around Talia, nor the fact that he had already known that Talia was Queen's own and what her gift was. The identity of an internee was not supposed to be generally known, and the gift of the Queen's own wasn't generally even a matter of public knowledge among the heralds themselves. He decided that he was a bit too tired for diplomacy and bluntly asked the older man where he'd gotten his information about Talia. Why, rumors mostly, Tedrick supplied in astonishment, although I didn't credit the half of them. I can't imagine a herald misusing a gift, and I can't believe the Collegium would allow anyone out who was poorly trained. And I've said so, but I must tell you there are a lot of eyes and thoughts up here, and I regret to say some of them hoping to catch a herald in failure. After a covering exchange of pleasantries, Chris climbed the stairs with a worried soul. He found Talia asleep on the bed and took his towels without waking her. He lay back in his hot bath to soak, his mind anything but relaxed. If anyone discovered the state Talia was in, not only would her reputation be finished, but the reputation of heralds as a whole and that of the Collegium would be badly damaged. The faith heralds themselves had in the Collegium would be shaken if they knew how poorly counseled she'd been. For that reason, they dared not abort the circuit and head back. That would be the signal of failure certain critics of the system had been waiting for. Nor could Chris himself let any senior herald know the true state of things and how poorly controlled Talia was, for that would lead to a profound disturbance in the ranks of the heralds themselves, a disturbance that could only roll all the way back to Selene and Elspeth with all the attendant problems it would cause them. It would be up to Chris and to Talia herself to get her back to the functional level she had before this whole mess blew up in their faces. It was with that sobering reflection he finished his bath and went to get dressed and wake her. She woke from her nap in a fairly good mood, giggling a little at the way she looked in the outsized garments Tedrick had supplied. It's because two-thirds of the heralds are men, little bird, Chris replied, and all the resupply stations get the same goods, so most of the clothing stored here will be made to fit men. I expect when he gets a chance to look... He'll find some things close to your size. If you think you look silly, look at me. The waist of his breeches was a closer fit than hers, but the legs were huge and baggy and much too long, and the sleeves of his shirt fell down past his fingertips. I expect most of what he has is in two categories, large and tent. At any rate, it's better to have to cut down than try to piece on more fabric. They descended the staircase to join their host, Chris Barefoot, and Talia in her sheepskin slippers, since their boots were so stiff from repeated soaking and drying that it was too much of an effort to try to pull them on. In any case, the dwelling was very well heated, and Chris's bare feet caused him no discomfort. They found the old herald puttering about in his room that seemed to combine the functions of kitchen and common room. He chuckled to see them, looking like two children clothed in their parents' cast-offs. "'I just took what was nearest to hand,' he said apologetically. I hope you don't mind. They're clean and dry and warm, Chris smiled, and right now that's all we care about. I must say that what I smell would have me pleased to come to table in a grain sack if that's all there was to wear. Tedrick looked very flattered and seemed to have no recollection of Chris's earlier interrogation. When one lives alone, one acquires hobbies. Mine is cooking. I hope you don't find it inferior to what you're used to. Talia laughed. Sir, 
What we're used to has been porridge, stew made with dried meat and old roots, half-burned bannocks, and more porridge. I have no doubt after the past month that your meal will taste as wonderful as your bathtub felt. Venison with herbs and mushrooms was a definite improvement over the meals they'd been making. A mental check assured them that Tedrick had seen to Roland, Tantris, and the Chiras in the same generous fashion. Both the companions were half asleep, with filled bellies, drowsing in heated stalls. When their own hunger was truly satisfied, Chris helped Tedrick clear away the remains of the meal, while Talia ran back upstairs for my lady. You seemed so interested in which of us was the musician that I thought we'd repay you for your hospitality, Chris said, taking the harp and beginning to tune her. One doesn't hear a great deal of music out here, Tedrick replied, not troubling to keep the eagerness from his eyes. I think it's the one thing that I really miss by being stationed here. When I rode circuit, I was always running into bards. The old herald listened with a face full of quiet happiness as they played and sang. It was quite plain that he had missed the company of other heralds, and equally evident that he had told the simple truth about missing music out here on the border. Of course, it was very possible that the traveling bards had simply not noticed this station, half hidden off the road and placed at a bit of a distance from Barry Bay. It was just as possible that Tedrick's work kept him so busy during the summer, the only time journeyman bards were likely to come this way, that he could not spare the time to seek the village when bards came through. Chris made a mental note to send a few words to that effect when they sent their next reports. Old Tedrick should not have to do without song again if he could help it. When they finally confessed themselves played out, Tedrick instantly rose and insisted that they seek their bed. I don't know what possessed me, keeping you up like this, he said. After all, I'll have you here for as long as it takes to outfit you. Perhaps I'll hide all the needles for a week or two. When they rose the next morning, somewhat reluctantly, as the feather bed they'd shared had been warm and soft and hard to leave, they discovered that he had already put their leathers and boots to soak in his vats of bleaching and softening solution. Talia helped him take some of their ruined garments apart to use as patterns, and they began altering the standard stock. Tedrick was every bit as good with a needle as he'd claimed. By day's end, they were well on the way to having their wardrobes replenished, and it was not possible to tell that the garments had not been made at the Collegium. By week's end, they were totally re-outfitted. Once their outfitting was complete, they set about discharging their duties to the populace of Berry Bay. The rest and the tranquility had been profoundly helpful in enabling Talia to firm up what control she had gotten back over her gift. She had enough shielding now to hold against the worst of outside pressure on her own. That wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. And she felt her control over her projective ability would hold good unless she were frightened or startled or attacked. If any of those three eventualities took place, she wasn't entirely certain what she'd do, but worrying about it wouldn't accomplish anything. She almost lost her frail bulwarks when they entered the village. Chris had warned her that the rumors had reached this far north, but the knowledge had not prepared her. When they set up in the village hall, she caught no few of the inhabitants giving her sidelong, cautious glances. But what was worse was that the very first petitioners wore charms against dark magic into her presence. She tried to keep up a pleasant, calm front, but the villagers' suspicion and even fear battered at her thin shields and made her want to weep with vexation. Finally, it became too much to stand. Cress, I've got to take a walk, she whispered. He took one look at the lines of pain around her eyes and nodded. He might not be an empath, but it didn't take that gift to read what the people were thinking when they wore evil eye talismans around one particular herald. Go, come back when you're ready, and not until. She and Roland went out past the outskirts of the village. Once away from people, she swore and wept and kicked snow hummocks until her feet were bruised and her mind exhausted. Then she returned and took up the thread of her duties. By the second day, the unease was less. By the third the evil eye talismans were gone. But she wondered what the reaction of the villagers was going to be 
when they sought out the weather witch on the morning of the 4th. The depression surrounding the weather witch's unkempt little cottage was so heavy as to be nearly palpable to Talia, and to move through it was like groping through a dark cloud. The weather witch sat in one cobwebbed, dark, cold corner, crooning to herself and rocking a bedraggled rag doll. She paid no heed at all to the three who stood before her. Tedrick whispered that the villagers brought her food and cared for her cottage, that she was scarcely enough aware of her surroundings to know when a meal was placed before her. Chris shook his head in pity, feeling certain that there was little, if anything, that Talia could do for her. Talia was half attracted, half repelled by that shadowed mind. If this encounter had taken place a year ago, she would have had no doubt but that she could have accomplished something. But now? But having come and having sensed this for herself, she could not turn away. She half knelt and half crouched, just within touching distance, on the dirty wooden floor beside the woman. She let go of her frail barriers with a physical shudder of apprehension and let herself be drawn in. Chris was more than a little afraid for her, Knowing nothing, really, of how her gift worked, he feared it would be only too easy for her to be trapped by the madwoman's mind, and then what would he do? Talia remained in that half-kneeling stance for so long that Chris's own knees began to ache in sympathy. At length, her breathing began to resume a more normal pace, and her eyes slowly opened. When she raised her head, Chris extended his hand to her and helped her to her feet again. Well, Tedrick asked, not very hopefully. The gypsy family who died of snow sickness two months ago. The ones in the Domesday Book report. Wasn't there a child left, Levin? She asked, her eyes still a little glazed. A little boy, yes, Chris answered as Tedrick nodded. Who has him? I for Smithright. He wasn't particularly pleased, but somebody had to take the mite in, Tedrick said. Can you bring him here? Would the Smithright have any objection if you found another home for the child? He wouldn't object, but here, forgive me, but that sounds a bit mad. It is a bit mad, Talia said, slumping with weariness so that Chris couldn't make out her expression in the shadows. But it may take madness to cure the mad. Just bring him here, would you? We'll see if my notion works. Tedrick looked rather doubtful, but rode off and returned less than an hour later with a warmly wrapped toddler. The child was colicky and crying to himself. Now get her out of the house, I don't care how, she told Tedrick wearily, taking the baby from him and soothing it into quiet. But make sure that she leaves that doll behind. Tedrick coaxed the weather witch to follow him out with a bit of sweet, after persuading her to leave her infant behind in the cradle by the smoky fire. Talia slipped in when her back was turned. Seconds after that, a baby's wail penetrated the walls of the cottage, and the madwoman started, as if she'd been struck. It was the most incredible transformation Chris had ever seen. The half-crazed, wild animal look left her eyes, and sense and intelligence flooded back in. In a few seconds, she made the transition from thing to human. Ch Chathry, she faltered. The baby cried again, louder this time. Chathry, she cried in answer, and ran through the door. In the cradle was the child Tedrick had brought, perhaps something under a year old, crying lustily. She scooped the child up and held it to her breast, holding it as if it were her own soul given back to her, laughing and weeping at the same time. No sooner did her hands touch the child when the last and perhaps strangest thing of all happened. It stopped crying immediately and began cooing back at the woman. Talia was not even watching, just sagging against the lintel, rubbing her temples. The other two could only watch the transformation in bemusement. At last the woman took her attention from the baby she held and focused on Talia. She moved toward her hesitantly and halted when she was a few steps away. Harold, she said with absolute certainty, you did this. You brought me my baby back. He was dead, but you found him again for me. Talia looked up at that eyes like darker shadows on her face, and shook her head in denial. No time, my lady. If anyone brought him back, it was you. And it was you 
who showed me where to find him. The woman reached out to touch Talia's cheek. Chris made as if to interfere, but Talia motioned him away, signaling him that she was in no danger. You will reclaim what was yours, the weather witch said tonelessly. Her eyes focused on something none of them could see, and no one will ever shake it from you again. You will find your heart's desire, but not until you have seen the heavens. The heavens will call you, but duty and love will bar you from them. Love will challenge death to reclaim you. Your greatest joy will be preceded by your greatest sorrow, and your fulfillment will not be unshadowed by grief. There is no joy that has not tasted first of grief, Talia quoted softly, as if to herself, so softly that Chris could barely hear the words. The woman's eyes refocused. Did I say something? Did I see something? she asked, confusion evident in her eyes. Was it the answer you were looking for? It was answer enough, Talia replied with a smile. But haven't you more important things to think of? My Jethry, my little love, she exclaimed, holding the child closely, her eyes bright with tears. There's so much I have to do to make it up to you. Oh, Harold, how can I ever thank you enough? By loving and caring for Jethry, as much as you do now, and not worrying what others may say about it, Talia told her, motioning to the other two to leave and following them quickly. Bright heavens! Tedrick exclaimed a little uneasily when they were out of earshot of the cottage. That was like old tales of witchcraft and curse lifting. What kind of strange magic did you work back there? To tell you the truth, I'm not very sure myself, Talia said, rubbing tired eyes with the back of her hand. When I touched her this morning, I seemed to see a kind of court, tie, something like that. Anyway, it was binding her to something, and I seemed to see that page in the report about the gypsies. I know outlanders aren't terribly welcome here, so I took a chance that the survivor wouldn't find a new home very easily. You confirmed what I guessed, Tedrick and it just seemed to me that what she needed was a second chance to make everything right. Am I making sense? More sense than I hoped for. It's hardly possible that he could be hers. Is it? Chris asked hesitantly. Chris, I'm no priest. How on earth can I answer that? All I can tell you is what I saw and felt. The little one is about the same age as hers would have been, and they certainly seem to recognize each other, if only as two lost ones needing love. I won't hazard a guess after that. This is a terribly callous thing to ask, I know, Tedrick said, looking a good bit less anxious now that the magic was explained away as rational common sense. But she won't lose her powers now that her mind is back, will she? Set your fears at rest. I think you and the people of Berry Bay can count on their weather witch yet, Talia replied. Speaking from personal experience, I can tell you that such gifts rarely lie back down to rest once you've roused them. Look at what she said to me. Love will challenge death to reclaim you, Chris quoted. Strange and rather ambiguous, it seems to me. Prophecy has a habit of being ambiguous, Tedrick said wryly. It's fortunate that she's able to be more exact when it comes to giving us weather warnings. Come now, you and Roland are tired and hungry, Talia, both of you. You deserve a good meal and a good night's rest before you take the road again. In prophecy to the contrary, my heart's desire at the moment is one of your venison pies, followed by a convivial quiet evening and a good sleep in your feather bed. And I hardly think I need to seek out the havens to find that. <laughs> Talia laughed tiredly, linking arms with Tedrick and Chris while Roland followed behind. Well, she had weathered this one. Now all she had to do was continue to survive. Chapter 11 Well, little bird, Chris said lazily, it's almost midsummer. You're halfway done. Evaluation, please. Talia picked idly at the grass beside her. Is this serious or facetious? Quite serious. 
The sun approached zenith, and a warm spot created when the white gold rays found a gap in the leaves of the tree overhead was planted just on Talia's right shoulder blade. Insects droned in the long grass. Occasionally, a bird called, sleepily. They were at the station at the bottom of their sector, where they had first entered, back last autumn. Today, or the next day, a courier herald would make a rendezvous with them, bringing them the latest laws and news. Until then, their time was their own. They had been spending it in unaccustomed leisure. She thought, long and hard, while Chris chewed on a grass stem, lying on his back in the shade, eyes narrowed to slits. It's been horrid, she said finally, lying back and pillowing her head on her arm. I wish these past nine months had never happened. It's been awful, especially when we first get into a town and they've heard about me, but... Hmm? He prompted, when the silence had gone on too long. But what if this, my gift going rogue, had happened at court? It would have been worse. You would have been able to get help there, he pointed out, better than you've gotten from me. Only after I wrecked something. Gods, I hate to think. Letting loose that storm in a packed court, she shuddered. At least I've got projection under control consciously now, rather than instinctively, even if my shields aren't completely back. Still having shield problems? You know so. You've seen me in crowds. There are times when I hate you for keeping me out here, but then I realize that I can't go back until I have my shields back, and we can't let anyone know about this mess until it's fixed, not even heralds. So, you figured that out for yourself. It didn't take much. If people knew that the rumors were at least partially true, they'd believe the rest of it. I've watched you play and protect her for me every time we meet another herald. And there's something else. I can't go back until I figure something out. What? Not just the how of my gift, but the why and the when. It's obsessing me. Because those rumors about manipulation come so close to the truth, I have used my gift to evaluate counselors, and I have acted on that information. When does it start becoming manipulation? I don't know. Now I'm more than half afraid to use the gift. Oh, hell. He flopped over onto his side, hair blowing into his eyes. Now that bothers me. Hellfire, none of this would have happened to you if I'd just kept my mouth shut. And it might well have happened at a worse time. And might not have. Those blue eyes bored into hers. What's gone wrong is as much my fault as yours. She had no answer for him. Well, the situation went wrong, but I think we're turning it around, he said at last. I hope so. I think so. Well, you're handling everything else fine. There was an uneasiness under his words. She was sensitive enough now to tell that it had something to do with her personally, not her as a herald. Oh, gods. She did her best to hide her dismay. She had done her level best to keep their relationship on a friend-lover basis and not let her gift manipulate him into infatuation, or worse. Most of the time, she thought she'd succeeded. But then came the times like these, the times when he looked at her with a shadowed expression. She knew now that she didn't want anything more from him, for as her need of him grew less, her feelings had mellowed into something very like what she shared with Skiff. But what of him? I wonder what Dirk's up to, he said out of the blue. He's sector riding this term, too. If he has any sense, being glad he's not having to eat your cooking. She threw a handful of grass at him. He grinned back. Tell me something. Why do you keep calling me Little Bird? Good question. It's Dirk's name for you. You remind him of a woodlark. What's a woodlark? She asked curiously. I've never seen one. You normally don't see them, you only hear them. Woodlarks are very shy, and you have to know exactly what you're looking for when you're trying to spot one. They're very small, brown, and blend almost perfectly with the bushes. For all that they're not very striking, they're remarkably pretty in their own quiet way. But he wasn't thinking about that when he named you. Woodlarks have the most beautiful voices in the forest. Oh, she said surprised by the compliment and not knowing quite how to respond. 
I can even tell you when he started using it. It was just after you'd fainted, and he'd picked you up to carry you to your room. Bright havens, said he. She weighs no more than a little bird. Then the night of the celebration when we all sang together. I caught him staring at you when you were watching the dancers and muttering under his breath, A woodlock. She's a shy little woodlock. Then he saw me watching him and glared for a minute and said, Well, she is. Not wanting to get my eyes blackened, I agreed. I would have agreed anyway. I always do when he's right. You two, she said, are crazy. No, my lady, we're heralds. It's close, but not quite to the point of actual craziness. That makes me crazy, too. You said it, he pointed out. I didn't. Before she could think of a suitable reply, they heard a hail from the path that led to their station and scrambled to their feet. It was their courier, and their courier was Skiff. Well, a day, he said, dismounting as they approached him. You two certainly look ale and elfy. Very much so for a pair who was supposed to have come near perishing in that midwinter blizzard. Dirk was damn worried when I talked to him. If you're going to be seeing him sometime soon, or can find a bard to pass the message, you can tell him that we're both fine, and the worst we suffered was the loss of Talia's harp case. <laughs> Chris said with a laugh. If! Bright havens! I haven't got any choice. I've been flat ordered to find him when I'm done with briefing you, on pain of unspecified torture. You'd have thought from the way he was acting that neither of you had the mother wit to save yourselves from a wetting, much less a blizzard. Chris gave Talia another odd, sidelong glance. You'd best bring your companion and whatever you've brought for us on up to the way station, she said. It's going to take you a while to pass everything to us and to make sure we've got it right. A while, O oh, modest Talia. With you, I've got no fear that it'll take long. Skiff grinned. I know quite well that you can memorize faster than I can, and Chris was my far-seeing teacher, so I know he's just as quick. I'll turn Simri loose and let her kick her heels up a little. I can lead the pack mule afoot. We'll take a tack for you, Chris offered. No use in you carrying it when we're unburdened. Skiff accepted the offer gladly, and they strolled up the path toward the station together. Chris, with the saddle and blanket balanced over one shoulder, Talia with the rest of the tack, Skiff with the saddlebags. I've brought you two quite a load, he told them as they approached the station, both material and news. Hope you're ready. More than ready, Talia told him. I'm getting pretty tired of telling the same old tales. Don't I just know? Well, I've got plenty of news, personal and public, and more than you may guess. Do you want your news first or your packs? Both. Chris said with the charming smile of a child. You can tell us the personal news while we gloat over our goodies. Why not? Skiff chuckled. I'll start with the collegium and work my way outward. The first bit of news was that Gaitha and Miro had surprised nearly everyone by suddenly deciding to wed. They had had themselves hand-fasted just before Skiff had left and were to be wedded in the fall. Chris's jaw sagged over that piece of news, but Talia, recalling things she'd seen over holidays while still a student, nodded without much surprise. Karen had broken her hip during the past winter. She'd slipped and taken a bad fall trying to rescue a companion foal from beneath a downed tree. The foal was frightened silly, but otherwise emerged from the ordeal unscathed. The same, obviously, could not be said for poor Karen. Cheryl had taken on Karen's duties as riding instructor as well as her own scheduled classes. When Karen's bones were healed, she decided that it was getting to be time to think about training a successor anyway, so they were currently sharing the classes. Albrecht had at last retired from teaching all but the most advanced students. To no one's surprise, he had appointed Jerry to take his place. Companions had chosen twenty youngsters this spring, the largest number yet. For the first time in years, the collegium was completely full. No one knew whether there should be rejoicing or apprehension over this sudden influx of chosen. The last time that the collegium had been full had been in Selene's father's time. There had been the Tedril Wars with Carsey on the eastern border shortly thereafter, and every one of the students had been needed to replace those heralds that had sought the havens when it was over. Elspeth was doing unexpectedly well and Talia rejoiced to hear it. Elkarth had taken her heavy schedule and lightened it by a considerable amount, 
and she had responded by working like a fiend incarnate on those classes that were left. She seemed determined to prove that she was not ungrateful for the respite, and that she did not intend to shirk her remaining responsibilities. There was little news of the court, but none of that was good. The rumor mills had been churning away, mostly working on the grist of Elspeth and the absent Talia. About half of it was elaboration on the rumors they already knew. The rest concerned Elspeth's supposed unfitness for the crown, that she was too pliant, too much of a hoyden, not bright enough, and too dependent on the heralds in general, and Talia in particular, to make all her decisions for her. Chris noted without comment the brief shadow of pain that veiled her face. But I've told anybody who's bothered to bring up the subject that whoever started these tales had holes in his skull. Elspeth's nothing but a normal tomboy like Jerry, and they were perfectly willing to consider Jerry's heir. And I told them nobody who knows you would even consider the idea that you might be misusing your gift. So, that's that. All right, it's your turn, Skiff ordered. You two have to tell me the old tale of your blizzard. I've been strictly charged by off the circle to bring back every detail. If you leave one thing out, I'm not entirely certain of my safety when I get back. Chris told most of it. From the plague at Waymeet to the arrival of Tedric, leaving out the disintegration of Talia's control. Sounds grim, Skiff said when they'd finished. I'm surprised you didn't tear each other's throats out. From boredom, if nothing else. Of course, you were too busy digging out to have time to be bored. Chris inhaled his wine and nearly choked to death trying to keep from laughing. Talia covered her blushes by pounding his back, then took over the conversation with a stern glance in his direction that almost sent him into another fit. It was a good thing we had the harp with us, she said, firmly restraining the urge to set both her hands around his throat and strangle him. Music did a lot to keep us going. And we discovered something really strange, Skiff. Did you know that those stories the Northerners kept telling us about how Chera sing are true? You've been on circuit too long, he replied with a disbelieving grin. She's telling the truth, Skiff, Chris asserted. Churras do sing. Well, hum is more like it. They do it intentionally, though, and I've heard worse harmonics coming from human throats. Can you prove this? Otherwise... I'm going to have a hard time convincing anyone else, much less myself. Are you planning on spending the night with us, so long as I'm not in the way? You can stay if you clean up dinner, Talia teased. We'll cook for you, but you'd better do your share of the work. Anything is better than having to eat my own cooking, Skiff replied with a hearty sigh. When I was interning, Dirk absolutely refused to let me cook anything after the first two meals I ruined. I don't blame him. I'm the only person I know that can boil an egg for an hour and have it turn out half scorched and half raw. Then you'll get your demonstration after dinner. When they had finished their evening meal, Talia called the churras up from the lake to the way station and gave the demonstration Skiff had demanded. As the first notes rose from the pack beast's long throats, Skiff's eyes widened in disbelief. A quick look around, however, soon proved to him that there was no trickery involved. After the first two songs, he relaxed and admitted that he found the weird harmonics quite pleasant, if at first startling. When they tired of singing, they began trading road tales. Skiff had by far the largest stock of funny stories, since his assignment as courier put him in contact with a wide variety of situations. In one case, He'd had to rescue his contactee at the meeting point from an amorous and overly enthusiastic cow. But in the midst of what Skiff had thought was one of his more amusing anecdotes, Talia suddenly excused herself and walked out into the night with some haste. Did I say something wrong? Skiff said, bewildered, since she had been giving every evidence of enjoying the story until then. What's the matter with her? I have no more idea than you, Chris started to say. Then he thought of something. Just wait a moment. He closed his eyes and mind called to Tantris. The answer he got made him half smile, although he spared a flash of pity for Talia. She'll be back in a little while, he told the puzzled Skiff, when she's less, shall we say, uncomfortable. Skiff was annoyed. Just what is that supposed to mean? Skiff, your Simri's a mare. 
That was fairly obvious. Roland's a stallion, a stallion that hasn't been near a companion mare for several months. Talia's gift, in case you've forgotten, is empathy, and unlike most of us, she tells me that Roland is always with her, in the back of her head, as she calls it. What? Skiff was bewildered. Then realization dawned. Oh, oh, I forgot a little experiment we did. You can't shield out your companion with a bond that tight, can you? That's it. Not on that level, you can't. And with her gift thrown in, it's even more overpowering. As I recall, you can barely mind speak, right? So you're protected from Simri's sporting. Needless to say, the same is not true for Talia. Skiff's chuckle was just a touch heartless. <laughs> too bad your tantris isn't a mare. I've had that thought a time or two myself, Chris admitted, joining the chuckle. Skiff sobered abruptly. Look, Chris, I know it's none of my business, but are you and Talia, you know? Damned right it's none of your business, Chris said calmly. He'd been expecting the question, assuming that Skiff was only waiting to get him alone. So, why are you asking? Chris, it's part of my job to notice things, and I've noticed that while you aren't cuddled up like courting doves, you're both a lot easier with each other than I've ever seen either of you around anyone else. Skiff paused, then remained silent. You were obviously planning on saying more. Go on. I owe Dirk. I owe him my life. By all rights, he should have left us when Simri and I fell into that ravine while I was interning. He had no way of knowing we were still alive, and the trail was washing out under him with every second he stayed. But he didn't leave. He searched all through that downpour until he found us, and if he hadn't, we wouldn't be here now. He's been acting damned peculiar whenever anybody mentions Talia. He was starting to act that way when you two left, and it's gotten worse since then. Dear old, I'm indifferent to women, Dirk, came close to tearing my heart out and feeding it to me when I couldn't give him any more information about you two than rumour. And I would bet my hope of havens that it wasn't over your welfare. So if you two are more than friends, I want to know. Maybe I can break it to him gently. Oh, gods, Chris said weakly. Oh, gods. I don't know, Skiff. I mean, I know how I feel, which is that... I'm quite fond of her, and that's all. But I don't know how she feels. I'm afraid to find out. I have the suspicion that there's a lot more going on here than you've told me, Skiff replied. You want to make a full confession? Gods. I'd better go back a few years. Look, the reason Dirk pretends to be indifferent to women is because he was so badly hurt by one that he came within a hair of killing himself. It was that bitch, Lady Narrow. It was when we were first assigned to court. She wanted me. I wasn't having any. So she used Dirk to get at me. Don't tell me. She played the sweet innocent on him. She tried working that one on me, but I'd had warning. I wish Dirk had. By the time I knew what was happening, it was too late. He was flopping like a stranded fish. She used him to set up a meeting between us, and at that point she handed me an ultimatum. Either I became her lapdog, or she would make Dirk's life hell for him. Unfortunately, she hadn't counted on the fact that Dirk was jealous as well as devoted. He'd stayed within earshot, and he heard the whole thing. Good gods! Skiff couldn't manage more than that. Verily. Chris closed his eyes, trying to shut out the memory of how Dirk had looked when he confronted them. It had been ghastly. Even his eyes had been dead. But what had followed had been worse. Chris had made a hasty exit, and when he'd gone, Narrell had taken Dirk to pieces. If only he'd known, he'd never have left them alone. But he was shattered. Absolutely shattered. I think it was only Aradi that kept him from throwing himself in the river that night. Now you tell me he's acting like... Like a man with a life bond, if you want to know the truth. He's close to being obsessed. Talia was showing signs of the same thing. But now, I just don't know, Skiff. We started sleeping together during that blizzard. There were a lot of other complications that I can't go into, and now I don't know how she feels. But I'm mortally afraid she's gotten fixated on me. 
And he was Dirk's best friend. Gods, gods, it was happening all over again. Well, what are you going to do about it? Skiff asked. I'm going to break it off, that's what, before it gets too serious to be broken off. If it is a life bond, once the infatuation is nipped in the bud, she'll swing back to Dirk like a compass needle. But for Lord's sake, don't let Dirk know about any of this. Chris rubbed his forehead, feeling almost sick with remorse. No fear of that. Skiff broke off what he was saying to nod significantly in the direction of the door behind Chris. Talia entered and resumed her abandoned seat, looking much cooler and more composed. Better, Chris asked in a sympathetic undertone. Much, she sighed, then faced Skiff. As for you, you troublemaker, I hope you're prepared to cosset a pregnant companion in another couple of months. Now, Talia, he chortled heartlessly, Simri's been at her games with every stallion I've rendezvoused with, and nothing like that has happened yet. Every other stallion wasn't rolling, she said with a wry twist to her lips. Serves you right, too, for not warning me, you smug sadist. Or don't you remember your history and the extraordinary fertility of grove stallions, particularly the companion of the Queen's own? Karnos's spear! I never once thought of that! Both Chris and Talia laughed at the expression on Skiff's face. I'd be willing to bet a full wineskin that Simri didn't think of that either, Chris added. You just won, Skiff said, reaching behind him into his pile of belongings and throwing a leather bottle at the other herald. Oh, well, no arm without a trace of good. This will keep me off the road, but it will also keep me from having to do my own cooking. I'd better start thinking of ways to make myself useful around the court and collegium. Hope Terran likes being courier. He's the only one free at the moment now that the new babies are done with orientation. He settled into his bedroll with a much bemused expression. The next day was involved in memorizing all Skiff had to impart to them. When both of them were letter-perfect in the early afternoon, Skiff packed up the few bits he had of his own personal gear and supplies and headed back the way he'd come. How much did you tell him? Talia asked, watching him depart. Only that we've had some complications I can't go into. I had to tell him. He noticed you weren't looking too well. That's all. He gave her yet another of those odd, sidelong glances. Lord, poor Elspeth, facing those damned rumor mongers all by herself. Gods, I need to be there, and I can't be there. That's right, you can't. Going back now won't do you any good and might do her harm. I know, but it doesn't stop me from wanting to. Look at it this way. With all the rumors that are bound to start about me and you, maybe they'll forget about the others. Oh, gods, she blushed, have I no privacy? Not as a herald, you don't. They walked back to the station. Chris was brooding about something. Talia could see it in the closed expression he wore and sense it in the unhappy unease that lurked below the surface of his thoughts. It was an unease she shared. She couldn't tell exactly what was bothering him, except that it had to do with her and with Dirk. She wondered if this was a sign that her worst fear was true, that he had become far more involved with her than he'd intended. She didn't want to hurt his feelings, but damn it all, it wasn't him she wanted. If only he'd talk to her. They read their letter packets in silence. Talia's was mostly brief notes and not very many of them. But the last letter had Talia very puzzled. It was enormous, from the thickness of the packet, and yet she couldn't recognize the handwriting on the outside. She frowned at it, recalling for a moment the evil days when virulent and anonymous letters were a daily occurrence. Then she steeled herself and broke open the seal, telling herself that there was no reason why she shouldn't pitch it into the fire if it turned out to be of that ilk. To her shock and delight... It was from Dirk. The actual letter was not very long, and the phrasing was stilted and formal, yet just to know that he'd written it gave her a delightfully shivery feeling. The content was simple enough. He hoped that her close association with his partner would lead to a closer friendship among the three of them, since they all shared the common interest of music. It was in light of this common interest that he had, he said, made bold to write her. 
He had been assigned to the sector that contained most of the kingdom's paper mills and printing houses and was the headquarters of the Printers and Engravers Guild. This meant that music and books that were difficult to obtain elsewhere were relatively common there. He had bought himself a great deal of new music and had thought that Talia and Chris should have copies also. It was what he hadn't said that both excited and worried Talia. The letter was so bland that it could have reflected either polite indifference to her or been an attempt to conceal the same sort of obsession that she was feeling. Still, it was definitely odd for him to have sent the music manuscripts to Talia instead of to Chris. Chris coughed uneasily, and she looked up to meet his eyes. "'What's the matter?' she asked. "'Dark's letter,' he replied. I'm usually lucky to get a page, maybe two, but this approaches perilously the size of an epic. That's odd. That's an understatement. He rattles on about nothing like a granny gossip at a fair, and it's what he doesn't write about that's the most interesting. He dances verbally about, doing his very best to avoid the subject of my internee. That's not easy to do in a letter this size. He doesn't mention you until the very end, and then only to say that he sent you some music that we all might like to try together sometime. It's as if he's afraid to write your name, for fear he'll give something away. Talia swallowed a lump that had suddenly appeared in her throat. Here's the music he sent, she replied, handing him the packet. Bright heavens! This must have cost him a fortune! Chris began sorting it into two piles, one for each of them, when something slipped out from amid the music manuscripts. Hm. What's this? He picked it up. It seemed to be a slim book bound in brown leather. He leafed through it. This, without any doubt, is intended for you, he said soberly, handing it to her. It was a book of ballads, among them the long version of Sun and Shadow. How do you know he didn't buy it for himself? she asked doubtfully. Or you? Because I happen to know he has two copies of that same book, both bound in blue, which happens to be his favorite color. One he keeps at his room, the other travels with him, and he knows I have the book. I'm the one that showed it to him. No, it's no accident that this was among the manuscripts, and it's undoubtedly the reason why he sent them to you instead of me. But, Talia, I have to talk to you. Seriously. God's here it came. I... He began looking, almost tortured, Look, I like you a lot. I think you're one of the sweetest ladies to wear whites, and I probably should never have let you get involved with me. What? she said, unable for a moment to comprehend what he was trying to say. Dirk is worth twenty of me, he continued doggedly. And if you stop to think about it, you'll realize I'm right about that. You're seeing more in our relationship than exists, than can exist. I just can't give you anything more than friendship, Talia, and I can't let you ruin your life and Dirk's by letting you go on thinking, Wait just a damned minute here, she interrupted him. You think that I'm infatuated with you? He looked surprised by her reaction. Of course, he replied in an insultingly matter-of-fact tone. All the tension that had been building up inside her came to a head. She'd been putting up with his occasional air of superiority, the slight condescension he used whenever later evidence proved that some decision of his that she'd opposed turned out to be right. And there was an underlying resentment on her part at his unvoiced attitude that getting her gift under control was now largely a matter of will and not the slow rebuilding of something that had been shattered past recognition. It was that, of course, that had been the spark to set the pyre alight. She turned on him angrily, fists clenching unconsciously. Of course, just because every other female falls languishing at your feet, you think I've no mind of my own? Well, he replied, taken aback, and obviously intending to try to say something to placate her. You, you, she was at a total loss for words. All this time, she'd been wasting, worrying about him, about hurting his feelings, and he had been blithely assuming that just because she'd been sleeping with him, she was obviously going to be fixated on him. Even now, he was still bewildered, perfect features blank with perfect astonishment. 
She pulled back her right arm and landed a perfect punch right on the end of that perfect chin. Chris found himself staring up at her from the ground in front of the station door with a jaw that felt dislocated. You conceited peacock! Humor me, will you? At least, she snarled, you can't accuse me of misusing my gift this time! He lifted one hand and felt along his jawline, a little dazed. No, that was a physical attack, all right. But by the time he answered, she had turned on her heel and stalked off toward the tiny lake into the darkness. By the time he gathered his wits and came after her, there was no sign of her beyond a little pile of clothing next to the blankets they'd spread there earlier in the day. Now he was beginning to become angry. After all, he hadn't meant to insult her, and a little worried as well. He began stripping off his own clothing to go in after her. As he waded in through the shallows, he saw something moving across the lake, coming toward him. Before he had any idea of what she intended, she pulled both his legs out from beneath him and yanked him under the water. Coughing and spluttering, he broke the surface again to see her bobbing just out of reach. She was laughing at him. Bitch! he yelled and dove furiously after her. But when he reached the place where she had been, she was gone, and the surface of the pond was undisturbed. He peered around in the dim light, trying to locate her when hands grasping his ankles gave him just enough warning to hold his breath this time. Once again he was pulled under, and once again she escaped without his laying a finger on her. This time when he surfaced and gasped for air, he did not immediately set out after her. When he didn't move, she called mockingly, That's not going to save you, you know, and dove under, vanishing. He waited for her to surface, ready to catch her before she'd fully located him. When she didn't, he waited for currents that would tell him she was somewhere nearby, beneath the water. Nothing happened, and he began to be a little concerned. She'd been under an awfully long time. He struck out for the spot he'd last seen her. He had no sooner begun to move when she erupted from the water immediately behind him. Hands on his shoulders drove him under. He kicked free and came thrashing back up to find her a bare finger length out of reach. Infatuated fool, am I? Stupid, am I? Then why can't you catch me? He kicked off after her, windmilling the surface energetically. She didn't seem to be expending half the effort he was, yet she sped through the water with ease, remaining out of reach with a laziness that galled. From time to time she'd vanish altogether, and this was the signal that he'd better hold his breath because shortly after her disappearance he would find himself pushed or pulled under the surface again. And no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't catch her even then. Finally, he took refuge in the shallows and waited for her to follow. Now he was angry, humiliated and angry, and ready to take her apart. She rose, dripping out of the water just out of reach. He glared at her and suddenly realized he'd put himself in a worse position than before. He was stark naked. He could probably pound her into the ground like a tent peg if he could get his hands on her, but if she could get even the tiniest amount of leverage to get a knee in, oh, she could hurt him. Anger, frustration, and acute embarrassment chased each other around inside of him until he was nearly vibrating with conflicting impulses, while she glared back, just as angry as he was, until something of his inner confusion communicated itself to her, and she collapsed to her knees, laughing helplessly. His anger ran away like water. He was completely exhausted. When anger stopped giving him an energy boost, he felt it. He turned his back on her, climbed out of the water, and dragged himself onto the waiting blanket without bothering to reach for a towel or his clothing. As he lay face down, panting, he heard footsteps behind him. No more, please, he groaned. You've won. I've lost. I'm an idiot. And a bore. Truce. You give up too easily, Talia laughed deep in her throat like a cat purring. And you deserved what you got. Karen's right. Every so often you start to think you can have everything your own way and you ought to have a lesson. She sat down beside him and he moved his head enough to see that she'd donned her short undershift and was toweling her hair vigorously. Where did you ever learn to swim like that? Cheryl, 
she replied. Oh, I've been able to swim since I was very little, but my efforts were a lot like yours, loads of thrashing to little purpose. After the time I was dumped in the river, Albrecht detailed Cheryl to teach me the efficient way to swim and how to keep from drowning under most conditions. Next winter she gave me a final exam by pushing me off the bridge fully clothed. Obviously I passed, though a pair of my boots is still probably residing at the bottom of the river. Good thing I'd almost outgrown them. Remind me never to anger either of you while swimming. Count Karen in on that too. She's just as good. Poor abused Cress. He could almost see her eyes sparkling with mischief. Are you half drowned? Three quarters and completely worn out. Forgive me, but I doubt that. She ran a delicate finger along his spine. He gritted his teeth and remained unmoving, trying his best to ignore the shivery, pleasant sensations she was causing. When he didn't respond, except for goosebumps, she simply laughed again and began stroking him delicately from neck to knees. He was determined not to yield and held himself as quiet as possible. Stubborn, hmm? <laughs> she chuckled. Before he had any notion of what she intended, she began fondling him in such a way that his original intentions went flying off in every direction. Witch, he said fiercely, and flipped over so quickly that he managed to get her pinned beneath him. I thought you were supposed to be worn out. I'll show you how worn out I am, he muttered, and began tormenting her in return, playing teasingly with every part of her that he could reach. She simply chuckled throatily and returned kind for kind. He held out as long as he physically could, but the conclusion was foregone. It left them both dripping with sweat and drained as well as sated. Lord of lights, he said when he was able to speak. If that's an example of what Roland does to you, I'm glad Tantris isn't a mare. By the time we finish this circuit, I'd be worn to a shadow. Instead of replying, she sighed, rose, and took the few steps to the water's edge, plunging gracefully back into the pond. When she returned, clean and dripping, she seemed to have regained a more tranquil mood. Chris took a brief dip himself, and by the time he got back, she was dry again, wearing her sleeveless tunic against the cooling breeze. He dried himself off and handed her the bottle Skiff had left with them. She took a long pull at it and gave it back. So, it's Midsummer's Eve, hmm? We never celebrated Midsummer on the Holdens, she said, and I was always at the Collegium during holidays after I was chosen. Not celebrate Midsummer? Why not? he asked in surprise. Because, according to the elders, it has no religious significance and is only a frivolous and lewd excuse for licentiousness. That's a quote, by the way. What do people usually do Midsummer's Eve? Your elders have a little right on their side. He couldn't help smiling. On Midsummer's Eve, at sunset, there are picnics in the woods. People always begin in large groups, but by this time of night, they've usually paired off. The excuse to sleep out tonight is that you need to sleep in the forest in order to find the freshest flowers in the morning. Believe it or not, when morning arrives, people do manage to pick flowers. For their lady loves. She probably hadn't meant it to sound cynical, but it did. Chris was too tired to take offense. No, for every female, no matter who. There's no female of any age that lacks a garland or bouquet. Those that have no relatives get them from anyone that can claim the remotest acquaintance with them. No one is left out, old or young. Women who have been or are about to be mothers get baskets of fruit as well. That day there are more picnics in the woods, family picnics this time, with a bit more decorum, and music and tales in the evening. Bards love it. They're sure to leave with their pockets full of coin, their hair full of flowers, and a young lady or gentleman on each arm. It's rather like a birthing day celebration, but on a bigger scale. Older folk don't celebrate birthing days either, except to deliver a lecture on responsibility, she said tonelessly. When is your birthing day? he asked curiously. Midsummer's Eve, tonight, which is no doubt why I'm such a demon child, having had the bad taste to be born on such a licentious night. So that's why you've been so off color. 
Chris snatched at the excuse to turn her mood around. You should have told me. I'm being more than a bit of a bitch, aren't I? I'm sorry. First I get mad and knock you down. Then I make a fool out of you, knowing damn well that I could probably swim rings around you. Then I half drown you, and I conclude by doing my best to ruin the rest of the evening by being sour. I'm being rotten, and I apologize. You've put up with my moods often enough. You're entitled to have off times yourself. Well, I think I've caught up for the next hundred years or so. I'm sorry I didn't talk to you about you and me before, he said, as the bottle came and went. I wish you had. You've been leaving me in knots because I was afraid I'd manipulated you into being fixated on me. I couldn't imagine why you'd be making love to me, unless it was because my gift had warped you. I'm not exactly the god's gift to men, and I've been mostly a problem to you on this trip. Oh, gods. He was at a complete loss for words for a long time. Finally, he handed her the bottle and caught her hand when she moved to take it. Talia, you are a completely lovable and lovely person. I care for you because you deserve it, not because your gift manipulated me. Dirk may well be life-bonded to you, and if that's true, I couldn't be happier. It would satisfy one of my dearest wishes that both of you should find partners who deserve you, and if those partners should be each other, that would make me one of the happiest people in this kingdom. Eh, she said hesitantly. I don't know quite what to say. Just don't hit me again. That's one response to being at a loss for words I'd rather you didn't repeat. Now... What else is bothering you? I'm tired. I'm tired of having to struggle for what seems to come easily to everyone else. I'm tired of having responsibility for the whole damned kingdom on my back. I'm tired of being alone and fighting my battles alone. Well, look, I know it has to be this way, but I don't have to smile and pretend I like it. And last of all, I'm feeling rotten because nobody has ever given me a midsummer garland or a birthday day present. Makes sense. The bottle was more than half empty. They'd shared it equally, and Chris was beginning to see things through a very delightful haze. How does it make sense? She demanded irritably. Because if you could have what you wanted, you wouldn't be upset, but you can't, so you are. Hm. It seemed like a brilliant deduction to Chris, and he examined the statement with delight. Talia shook her head as she tried to reason it out. That just doesn't come out right somehow, she complained. It will, after another drink, he passed her the bottle. When the last drop of liquor was gone, so was her ill temper. I am very, very glad that we've got something to sleep, sleep on right here, Chris said carefully. Is, <clears throat> it's much nicer, you can see the stars, and I can't walk anymore anyway. Stars are nice, she agreed. Not moving's nicer. See the wane? Who? The wane. Those stars just over the big pine there. Five for the bed and the axle, two for the wheels, three for the tongue. Wait a minute, she peered at the stars, trying to get them to form up properly, and was delighted when she finally did. What's the rest of them? Right next to the Wayne's the Hunter. There's the two little stars for his belt, two more for his shoulders, four for his legs. He realized by her steady breathing that she had fallen asleep. He reached over for the second blanket and covered them both with it, without disturbing his floating head much. He lay back, intending to think a little, but... A little thinking was all he managed, since he, too, was soon drowsing. The next morning he woke before she did, and remembered the conversation of the night before. He moved very carefully, hoping that he wouldn't wake her, and, on being successful, moved off into the woods on a private search. Talia woke to an incredibly subtle perfume wreathing around her. She opened sleep-blurred eyes to see where it was coming from, to discover that someone had placed a bouquet by her head. What? she said sleepily, trying to think why there should be flowers beside her. Who? A joyous midsummer to you, Harold Talia, and a wonderful birthing day as well, Chris said cheerfully from a point behind her.
It's a pity that more of your friends couldn't deliver trifles, but you'll have to admit that we are a bit far from most of them. I trust you'll accept this one as a token of my profound apology for insulting you last night. I didn't intend to. Chris, she exclaimed as she sat up and took up the flowers, breathing the exquisite fragrance with hedonistic delight. You didn't need to do this. Ah, but I did. It wouldn't be midsummer unless I gathered at least one bouquet. Besides, that scent you're enjoying is supposed to be a sovereign remedy for hangover. Is it? She laughed. I have no idea, he admitted. Part of my hangover always includes a stopped up nose. Look at the stems, why don't you? Holding the bouquet together was a silver ring of a design of two hands clasped together. It was the token a herald only gave to the friends he loved best. Chris, I don't know what to say. Then say, Thank you, Chris, and I accept your apology. Thank you, love, and I do accept your apology, if you'll accept mine. I would be only too pleased to, he said, giving her a cheerful grin. Dear heart, I'd intended to give you that at midwinter, but since you said you'd never had a birthing day gift, the opportunity was too good to pass by, and it had damn well better fit. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to get someone's ring size without them knowing. It goes on the right hand, little bird. The left is reserved for another purpose. Talia slipped it on, vowing to discover when Chris's birthing day was so as to return the gesture with interest. It's perfect she said, as he sat down next to her with a very pleased expression. She threw her arms around him, completely happy for the first time in months, and opened a tiny channel of rapport deliberately so that he could know what she couldn't say in words. Who, that's as intoxicating as what we were drinking last night, little bird. She took the hint and closed the channel down again, but she could tell that he had enjoyed the brief thrill. What are these flowers? I've never smelled anything so wonderful in my life. I think I could live on the scent alone. A little deep woods northern flower that only blooms at this time of year. It's called Maiden's Hope. I thought you might like it. I love it. She continued to breathe in the scent of the flowers with her eyes half shut. Chris thought with amusement that she looked rather like a young cat in her first encounter with Catmint and told her so. I can't explain it. It smells like sunrise, like a perfect spring day, like the heart's desire. How about like breakfast? He replied comically. Breakfast? Oh, well, if that's your heart's desire. She laughed at him and rose smoothly to her feet. It's my turn, so I guess I'd better reward you for being so outrageously nice to me after I tried to murder you last night. And since you seem so enamored of those flowers, I'll see that you have some in your wedding garland, if I have to nurture them in a hothouse myself. I thought you had a black thumb. She removed one of the creamy white blossoms and tucked it behind one ear. For you, little bird, my thumb will turn green. I never break my promises if I can help it, and this one I definitely intend to keep. Then I'd better keep my promise of breakfast. Where will I get my flowers if I let you wither away of starvation? They gathered their scattered belongings and returned arm in arm to the way station. Chapter 12 Geese honked overhead, heading south. It had been one of those rare, glorious, golden autumn days, far too lovely a day to spend indoors, so Talia and Chris had been hearing petitions stationed behind a wooden trestle table set out in front of the inn door. Their last petitioner had been a small boy leading a very large plow horse, and he had given them a message. Talia scanned the letter and handed it without comment to Chris. He read it in silence, while the scruffy child who had brought it scuffed his feet uneasily through the pile of golden leaves at his feet. Chris returned the message to her as she braced her arm on the rough wood of the trestle table and leaned her chin on one hand. How long ago did all this happen? she asked the boy. About two days, he said, combing dark hair out of his eyes with his fingers. Few though, but it's been on years. Wouldn't be so bad this time, set for the poisoned well. That's why Grandther sent me. Reckons in settling now. 
for somebody gets killed. Talia looked up at the position of the sun and added figures in her head. I'm for riding out now, she said finally. Advice? Chris brushed more leaves off the table and glanced back over his shoulder at the inn behind them. We don't have any more petitions to be heard, but riding out to a place that isolated is going to take the rest of the afternoon. We'll have to ride half the night to make up the time, and we won't have the chance to reprovision until we get to Knoll's Crossing. Talia Shields chose that moment to go down. She felt the boy's anxiety with enough force to make her nauseous while she fought them back into place. She couldn't manage more than half strength, could still feel the child fretting after they were up. I take it that means you think we should reprovision now and wait until tomorrow morning? More or less. Well, I don't agree. Let's wrap things up here and move out. She could feel his disapproval as they followed behind the child, perched like a toy on the back of an enormous, thick-legged horse that was more used to pulling a plow than being ridden. You let the boy manipulate you, he said finally, as their mounts and chiras kicked up swirls of leaves. I didn't. A poisoned well is a serious business out here. It indicates a situation gone out of control. Are you willing to have deaths on your conscience because we dallied today, boy, in supplies? She whispered but her tone was angry. He shrugged. My opinion doesn't matter. You are the one giving the orders. She seethed. They argued frequently these days. Now and again it was something a bit more violent than an argument. Chris often seemed to take a stand opposing hers just for sheer obstinacy. You bastard, she said as the reason occurred to her. The boy looked back at her, startled. She lowered her voice. You are just opposing me to see if I can be manipulated, aren't you? He grinned ruefully. Sorry, love. It was part of my orders, including manufacturing emotions, since you can sense them. Face it, if anybody is going to be able to warp your decisions, it would be your counselor. But now that you know... You can stop giving me headaches, she replied tartly. Now let's get down to business. You could have used your gift back there, he said as they settled at last into their bed. It had taken a long, hard ride through the moonless, frosty night to reach their station once the feud had been settled. And it had taken a lot of negotiation to get it settled. I... I still haven't figured out the ethics of it, she answered slowly. Haven't it? and having people's emotional states shoved in my face is bad enough, I still don't really know when it's right to use it. Damn. What if it had been the only way to take care of the problem? Then what would you have done? Chris was worried about this. He was afraid that if an emergency arose and the only way to deal with it was by exercising that gift, she might well freeze. And if it came to using it offensively, the likelihood of her freezing was all the greater. I don't know. A long pause as she settled her head on his shoulder. The only other people I know of with empathy are healers, and they are never going to come into contact with the situations I have to deal with. Where are the boundaries? He sighed and held her, that being the only comfort he could offer her. I don't know either, little bird. I just don't know. Chris leaned his aching head against the cold stone mantelpiece of the station fireplace. This had not been a good day. By now the rumors about her had spread everywhere they went. Although this was not their first visit to Langenfield, the villagers met Talia with unease and a little fear, and often wearing evil eye talismans. They were obviously uncomfortable with her judgment and her abilities. Talia had given no impression of anything but confidence, intelligence, and rock-steady trustworthiness, despite the fact that Chris knew that she had been trembling inside from the moment she passed the village gates. This situation had been one she'd had to face over and over again every time they entered a new town. He felt Talia's hand touch his shoulder. "'I'm the one that should have the headache,' she said softly. "'Not you.' Damn it, I wish you'd let me do something about this. What? 
What can you do? Give them a lecture. I have to win their trust and win it so firmly that all their mistrust starts to look foolish in their own eyes. I could make it seem like I'm the one taking the lead. Oh, that's a great idea. Then all they'll do is wonder if I'm manipulating you like a puppet, she retorted bitingly. Then I could back you up, damn it. He met her anger with anger of his own. They glared at each other like a pair of angry cats until Talia broke the tension by glancing down. Chris followed her glance to see that her hands were clenched into tight fists. Damn, I was all set to give you another love pat, wasn't I? She asked, chagrined. This, God's between my shields being erratic and having to face the same situation over and over, I'm like a harp string tuned too high. Chris forcibly relaxed his own tight muscles, including his fists. I should know better than to provoke you. Intellectually, I understand you have to face the battle and win it on your own, but emotionally it's a strain on both of us, and I can't stop wanting to help. That's why I love you, Peacock, she said, putting both hands around his face and kissing him. And, Havens, wait here. It's been such a rotten day, I totally forgot. He stared after her in puzzlement as she dashed out the station door and returned, brushing snow from her shoulders. I left this in a pocket on my saddle so I wouldn't forget it, and then I go and forget it. She pressed a tiny, wrapped parcel in his hand. Happy birthday. How did you... He was surprised. I... Unwrap it, silly. She looked inordinately pleased with herself. It was a ring, identical to the one he'd given her months ago. I... He swallowed the lump that had appeared in his throat. I don't deserve this. In a pig's eye, you've earned it a dozen times and more, even if you do tempt me to kill you once a week. Only once a week, he managed to grin to match hers. You're improving, or I am. Now I did remember to get a nice fresh pair of quail, honey cake, and a very good bottle of wine. She slid her arms around his, stood on tiptoe, and kissed the end of his nose. Now, shall we make this a proper birthday celebration or not? Now came the stop she was dreading above all others, Heavenbeck. There hadn't been a more pleasant winter afternoon on this entire trip. Cold, crystal clear air, sunlight so pure it seemed white, a cloudless and vibrant blue sky above the leafless white boughs of the grove of birch they were passing through. Snow on the ground sparkled. The air felt so clean and crisp it was almost like drinking chilled wine. Talia let the cheer of the day and of the others elevate her own spirits. After all, there was no reason to think that the people of Heavenbeck would be any worse than the rest of what she'd dealt with. It was unlikely in the extreme that anyone except the old miser and his wife would remember her or that she'd nearly let her own troubles distract her from what could have become a serious situation. They were several miles from Heavenbeck when Talia was suddenly struck by a wall of fear, pain, and rage. She reeled in her saddle, actually graying out as Chris steadied her. She came back to herself, feeling as if she'd been hit with a war hammer. Chris was still holding her, keeping her from falling off of Roland's back. Chris, she gasped, far sea to heaven back. Then it was her turn to steady him as he willed himself into deep trance. Her head still rang with the fierce anguish of the emotions she'd encountered. She breathed deeply of the crisp air to try and clear it and clamped down on her shields, and for once they actually worked right up to full strength. It hardly seemed as if he'd dropped into his trance before he was struggling up out of it again, blinking his eyes in confusion. Northern Raiders, he said with difficulty, still fogged with trance, though how they got past sorrows. Damn, and no help nearer than two days. How many? Ten, maybe fifteen. Not too many for us to handle, I don't think. I'd hoped you would ride your internship without seeing any fighting he said hesitantly. She jumped down off Roland and headed for the churras, her feet crunching in the snow. Well, we haven't got a choice. Trouble's there. We'd better deal with it. Talia, I'm just a herald. But you're the only queen's own we've got. I also shoot better than you do, she said crisply, 
sliding his sword and dagger out of his pack and reaching over the chura's furry back to hand them to him. If it'll make you feel any better, I promise not to close in for hand to hand unless I have to. But you hand it over responsibility, and unless you overrule me, I say I'm going. Ten to fifteen aren't too many for both of us, but they could be, for one alone. All right. Chris began strapping his weapons on, while Talia led the chiras off the road entirely. With snow creaking beneath her feet, she took them into the heart of a tangled evergreen thicket out of view of the roadway. There she tethered them lightly, the scent of bruised needles sharp in her nostrils, and backed out, breaking the snow cake to powder and brushing it clear of footprints with a broken branch. She laid a gloved hand lightly on Roland's neck as his breath steamed in the cold air. Tell them to stay there until dark, Cloverling, she murmured. If we're not back by then, they can pull themselves loose and head back to the last village. Roland snorted, his breath puffing out to hang in front of his nose, and stared fixedly at the thicket. Ready? He tossed his head. How about you? She looked to Chris, whose face was pale and whose mouth was set and grim. We'd better hurry. They were about to break down the gate. She stripped the bridle bells from both sets of harness and vaulted into the saddle with a creaking of leather. Let's do it. They made no effort to come up quietly, just set both companions to a full gallop and hung on for dear life. White hills and black trees flashed past them. Twice the companions vaulted over fallen tree trunks that the villagers had not yet cleared away from the roadbed. As they galloped up over the last hill, the sun revealed the plight of the village in merciless detail, black of ash, red of blood, orange of flame, all in high contrast against the trampled snow. The raiders were just breaking through the palisade gate as they came galloping up. Enormous iron axes swung high, impacting against the tough iron oak of the gate with hollow thuds. The noise the bandits were making covered the approach of the two heralds entirely, between the sound of the axes against the wood and the war cries they were shrieking. Three or four of their number lay dead outside the palisade, blood soaking into the snow about them. The gate came down just as the heralds got into arrow range. Most of the rest surged through the gates and into the village. There were still a handful of reavers outside. To her relief, Talia saw nothing among them but hand weapons, no bows of any kind. Roland skidded to a halt, hooves sending up a shower of snow as Talia pulled an arrow from the quiver of her saddle bow without looking and knocked it. She aimed along the shaft, feeling her own hands strangely calm and steady and shouted, her high young voice carrying over the baritone growls of the raiders. They turned. She found her target almost without thinking about it, a flash of pale skin above a shaggy, dark fur, and loosed. One of the raiders took her arrow squarely in the throat. He clutched at it, crimson blood welling round his fingers and spotting the snow at his feet. Then he fell, and she was choosing a second target. There was no time to think, only to let trained reflexes take over. Talia's next two arrows bounced harmlessly off leather chest armor and a battered wooden shield. Chris had not stopped when she had, but had sent Tantris hurtling past her, charging headlong into the gap where the gate had been while the reavers were busy protecting themselves from her covering fire. That seemed to decide the ones still left outside. They rushed her. She got off one more shot, picking off her second man with a hit in his right eye. He went down. Then Roland warned her he was going to move. She clamped her legs tight around his barrel as he pivoted and scrambled through the churned-up mud and snow along the palisade. When they were still within arrow range, he pivoted again, hindquarters slewing sideways a little, mane whipping her chest. She already had an arrow knocked. She sighted again and brought down a third with a solid hit in his chest where an armor plate had fallen off and not been replaced. A puff of breeze blew a cloud of acrid smoke over the palisade. She coughed, and her eyes watered as she groped for another arrow. The remaining three men came on, howling, spittle-flecking beards and lips, as her fingers found another shaft in the rapidly emptying quiver. The nearest, bundled in greasy bearskins, stopped and poised to throw his axe. That was long enough for her to sight and loose. Her arrow took him in the throat and he flung the axe wildly, hitting only the palisade as he collapsed. Then Roland charged the two that were left. 
Talia clung with aching legs and arrow hand while he reared to his full height and smashed in the head of the first one in his path. It was a horrible sound, like a melon splitting open. Talia felt the shock as Roland's hooves connected, heard the surprised little grunt the man made. Blood and fear and stale grease and sweat smells stank in their nostrils. The last one was too close for arrow shot. Talia felt at her belt for her throwing dagger, pulled it loose, and cast it at short range. This one had worn no chest armor at all. He stopped short, his eyes surprised. His sword fell from his hand, and his free hand felt at his chest. He looked down stupidly at the dagger protruding from his ribs. Then his eyes glazed over, and he fell. Talia and Roland raced for the gate. She glanced behind her for possible foes and saw they were leaving red hoof prints behind them. She was met with a chaos of burning buildings and screaming people. They thundered inside and skidded to a halt, confused for a moment by the fear and smoke. Talia felt more than saw a fear-maddened ox charging down the single street, saw out of the corner of her eye a child running straight into its path. Roland responded to her unspoken signal, whirled with joint-wrenching suddenness and leapt forward. She leaned out of the saddle, clinging to the saddle bow, and scooped up the child as Roland shouldered the oncoming animal aside. Then he leapt again, giving Talia the chance to deposit the baby on a doorstep. Chris was nowhere to be seen, but neither were the raiders. Talia vaulted off Roland's back and began grabbing hysterical townspeople, Without stopping to think about it, she began forcibly calming them with her gift and organizing them into a fire brigade. All the while she fought the urge to flee away, to somewhere dark and quiet and be sick. She kept seeing those surprised eyes, feeling the fear and pain just outside of her shields. But there was no time to think, just to act and pray that her shields stayed up, or she had no idea what might happen under such a load. Chris appeared when the fires were almost out, face smudged with smoke, whites liberally splashed with blood, eyes dull. Tantris stumbled along beside him. Talia left her fire brigade to deal with what was left, just as cheering villagers appeared in his wake, waving gore-encrusted scythes and mattocks. She limped to his side. Only now was she noticing she'd sprained her left ankle and wrenched her right shoulder when she'd caught up that child. He lifted his eyes to meet hers, and she saw reflected in them her own bleak heart sickness. She took the bloody sword from his unresisting hand, fought down her own revulsion, and touched his hand, hoping to give him the ease she could not yet feel. He sighed and swayed and leaned against Tantris for support. Tantris was as blood-speckled as Roland and had a shallow cut along one shoulder, they wouldn't surrender and wouldn't run, he said, voice harsh from the smoke and the shouting. I don't know why. The healer's dead, that poor mad girl with him. There's about ten more dead and <clears throat> twice as many wounded. Thank gods. Thank gods, no children. That couple burned to death trying to save their damned chickens. Three houses burned out at the other end of the village. He stared at the townsfolk, cheering and laughing and dancing awkwardly in the bloody snow and churned up mud. They think the battle's over. Goddess, it's just beginning. The ruined food stores, the burned-out houses, and the worst of winter yet to come. Ed, it's not like in the ballads, is it? No, he sighed, rubbing his eyes with a filthy hand. It never is, and we have a job to do. Then let's get the cheers back and set about it. Their second stopover at Waymeet, by contrast, was almost embarrassing, Chris being held as the village's hero for having remained behind to tend the ill while Talia went for help. It became necessary to remind the grateful people of the rules that governed a herald's behavior on circuit, else they would have been feasted at a different house every night, slept in the best beds in the village, and come away with more gifts than the chiras could carry. That stop went a long way toward raising their spirits, both their spirits, for there were no evil-eyed talismans on display in Waymeet, and there were no odd, sidelong glances at Talia. 
and her shields, were holding, were still holding. They stopped with Tedrick at Berry Bay. He proved to be more than delighted to welcome them, and a two-day rest with him, and a chance to cry out their heart sickness on the shoulder of someone who would truly understand, completed their cure. When they were back to making normal conversation, Tedrick mentioned, with the pleasure of a child in a new toy, that since their visit, the wandering bards had taken to stopping overnight with him, and that scarcely a month went by now without at least one arriving on his doorstep. Chris thought of his report and smiled to himself. Maven Weatherwitch and her adopted child were thriving. Her ability to foresee had actually grown. The grateful people of Berry Bay allocated a portion of their harvests to her so that she need not take the chance of losing the gift to hunger or an accident in the fields. Best of all, the local priestess of Astera was training her to become her own successor, and Talia Shields continued to hold. They rode through the early spring leaves, scarcely more than buds, on their last few stops for this circuit. Come vernal equinox, scarcely more than a month away, they would turn their chiras over to the next herald assigned to this circuit and would be on their way back to the collegium. It was over. It was almost over. Talia felt her control was back and more certain than before. Her shields were back and stronger. Now, if only, if only she could ease the aching doubt in her mind, the rights and the wrongs. The unanswered questions kept her up nights, staring into the darkness long after Chris had fallen asleep at her side. For if she could not find an answer for herself, how could she ever again dare use the gift she'd been born with except in utterly circumscribed circumstances? Birds newly arrived from the south sang in the budding bushes all around them. Trees seemed to be covered with a mist of green. Talia was not expecting trouble, so when Chris asked her to deliberately drop her shields and cast her senses ahead to Westmark, what she encountered caught her completely off guard. The force of emotion she felt sent her slumping forward as if from a blow to the head. Chris urged Tantris in close beside her and steadied her in the saddle as she shook her head to clear it. What is it? he asked anxiously. It can't be. It's not raiders, but it's bad. There's death, and there's going to be more unless I get there fast, she said. You bring on the chiras while I go ahead. She sent Roland into his fastest gallop, leaving Chris and the pack beasts far behind. They flashed through beams of sunlight cutting between the trees like spirits of winter come to invade the spring. She narrowed her eyes against the rush of greening wind in her face and the whipping of Roland's mane, trying to sort out the images she'd gotten. She had touched the terrible, mindless violence of a mob and two sources of fear. One, the fear of the hunted. The other, the fear of the hopeless. Underneath it, like a thin stream of something vile, had lurked a source of true and gloating evil. Even above the pounding of Roland's hooves, she heard the mob as she neared the outer wall of Westmark, a sturdy and skilled piece of bricklayer's work, dull red behind the pale mist of opening leaves. She heard the hair-raising growl long before she saw the mob itself. She had no need to be in trance, to feel the turmoil of emotions, though by the grace of the lady they hadn't yet found their victim. She could almost taste his fear, but it wasn't the panic of the caught creature yet. As she came within sight of the mob, a single figure burst from under cover of the town gates and ran for his life straight toward her, his feet kicking up yellow road dust as he ran toward her. At the sight of him, the people hunting him howled and plunged through the gates after him. He seemed determined to cast himself under Roland's hooves if it was necessary to do so in order to reach her. With all the skill, burned into both of them by Karen, she and Roland avoided him and wheeled around in a wrenchingly tight circle, putting Roland's bulk between the fugitive and his hunters. The stranger seized the pommel of her saddle in a white-knuckled death grip and gasped, Justice! She remained in the saddle, certain that if all else failed, she could have him up behind her and be away before any of the mob could react. But at the sight of her companion and her unmistakable uniform, the crowd slowed, 
began muttering uncertainly and finally stopped several feet away. When she spoke, a silence fell upon them. Why do you hound this man to his death? she demanded, pitching her voice to be carrying and trumpet clear. The crowd before her, no longer the mindless mob now that their momentum was broken, stirred uneasily. Finally, one man stepped forward. By his fine, dark, umber wool and linen clothing, prosperous, and no farmer. That traitor's a murderer, Harold, he said. A foreigner, and a murderer. We reckon on giving him his due. Nay, the man at her saddle panted. Olive skin gone yellow pale, large, dark eyes wide with fear. Traitor, yes, and foreign, but no murderer. This I swear. An angry growl arose at his words. Hold, she shouted pitching her voice to command before they could regain their mob unity. It is no crime to be a foreigner, and the Queen's word grants Harold's justice to anyone within the bounds of this kingdom who would claim it. This man has claimed justice of me. I will give it to him. You who call him a murderer. Did any of you see him kill? The body was in his wagon, and still warm, the spokesman protested, rubbing his mustache uneasily. So... And was the wagon then so secured that none could enter it but he? No? Then how can you be certain that the body was not put there to turn suspicion upon this one, already suspect because of being foreign? The dismay she felt told her that they had not considered the possibility. These were not evil people. That thread of viciousness she had sensed was not coming from one of them. They were only thoughtless and easily led while in the herd mentality of the mob. Confronted with someone who made them think, they lost their taste for blood. This will be done by the law, or not at all, she said firmly. Let every man, woman, and child not bedridden assemble in the square. At this point there is not one of you above suspicion. Let the body be brought to me there. The man clinging to her pommel was slowly regaining his courage and his breath. I have heard of your kind, Lady Harold, he said, obviously nervous, by the sweat only now beginning to bead his generous forehead, but equally obviously willing to trust her. I swear to you that I did not do this evil deed. You may put me to the ordeal, if you will. There will be no ordeal, and nothing to fear if you are truly innocent, Talia told him quietly. I do not know what you have heard of us, but I pledge that you shall have exactly what you asked of me. Justice. The traitor walked beside her as she rode Roland into the town gates, past the substantial bulks of the brick houses, and on to the cobblestone square. Exactly as she had ordered, every ambulatory person in the town that day was assembled there. They had left an empty space for her in the middle, and in this space there lay a long, dark draped bundle, plainly the victim. Talia picked out two dozen robust-looking, mortar-bespeckled citizens and ascertained by questioning them under her gift that they could not have had anything whatsoever to do with the crime, as they had all been engaged in moving the town wall outward. She set these men, armed with cudgels, to guarding the exits to the square, since once the killer realized that he or she was about to be uncovered, he might try for an escape, and Talia did not intend that he should succeed. Then she removed the blanket. The young woman, girl almost, had been beaten severely, and her neck was broken. She had been pretty. Her clothing was well made, not badly worn, but had been ripped in many places. Whoever was guilty of this was brutal and violent, and nothing Talia sensed in the traitor corresponded to the kind of mind that could batter a young girl to death. The crime did match that thread of evil she'd sensed, before she confronted the mob, however. "'Who was this child?' she asked, after giving her own nerves a moment to steady. "'My stepdaughter.' A square-jawed, bearded man stepped forward, his face hard, his brown eyes unreadable. Talia noted that he did not address her with the honorific herald. This might mean much or nothing. "'When was she found, and by whom?' "'About an hour ago, herald.' A thin, graying woman in a flowery apron spoke up. My boy, founder, 
I'd sent him to the trader with the money for some things I'd asked him to set aside for me. She pushed forward a lanky blonde lad of about fifteen with a sick expression and greenish face. Tell me what you found, as exactly as you can remember it, Talia ordered, pity making her move to shield him from view of the body. Ma, he gulped, eyes fixed on her face. Ma, she sent me, like she said, with egg money for some fripperies she'd asked the trader to hold for her. When I got to the wagon, the trader wasn't there, but he's told us to go in and wait for him times of four when he weren't there, so I did. It were kind of dark inside, and I stumbled over something. I flung the door open to see what I were a-fallin' over. It were Carly, he swallowed hard, his face growing greener. I thought maybe she were sick, maybe drunk even, so I shook her, but her head rolled so funny. He scrubbed his hand against his tunic in an unconscious effort to rid it of the contamination he'd felt from touching a corpse. Enough, Talia said gently. The poor child could never have seen violent death before, much less touched it. She remembered how she had felt after the fight at Heavenbeck and tried to put her sympathy in her eyes. Have any of you ever seen this girl with the traitor before? Several people had volunteering that she'd had huddled, whispered conferences with him, conferences that broke off, if any came near. Feet scuffled uneasily on the cobblestones as she continued her interrogations as thoroughly and patiently as she could, and she could hear little whispers at the edge of the crowd. She wished she could hear them clearly, for they might tell her a great deal. The man who claimed to be the murdered girl's stepfather spat angrily and interrupted, We're wasting time. Anyone with eyes and ears knows the scum killed her. He wanted her, no doubt, then killed her when she refused him, or if she did not refuse for fear she'd make him wet her after. Talia's eyes narrowed. This hardly sounded like a grief-stricken parent. I am the instrument of the Queen's justice, and it is I and no one else who will decide when we are wasting time, she said coldly. Thus far I have seen nothing to implicate this man, beyond him speaking with the girl. I am sure she spoke to many. Did she not speak daily even to you? Does this make you a suspect? Was it her imagination, or did he pale a trifle? Traitor, what say you? May I speak all the truth? he asked. Now that was an odd way to answer. Why need you ask? Because... I would not malign the dead before her kith and kin, but what I would say may not meet with the approval of those here. Wait but a moment, traitor, she answered, and closed her eyes. She took a moment to pass deeply into trance and invoke once again the truth spell. There were two stages of this spell. The first stage could be cast by any herald, even those with only a touch of a gift. It caused a glow, invisible to the speaker but quite apparent to anyone else, to form about the speaker's head and shoulders. The second stage, and one which required not just a gift but a powerful communication gift, could, when invoked, force the speaker to tell only the truth, regardless of his intentions. Talia's gift was sufficient to enable her to bring both forms of the truth spell into play, and she invoked them now. As the blue glow formed about the traitor's head, she could hear a sudden intake of breath, then sighs of relief. These people might never have seen truth spell in action in their lives, but they knew what it was, and they trusted in the power of the spell and the honesty of the wielder. Tell all the truth freely. You cannot hurt her in the havens, and it is your own life you are defending. She came to me several times, yes, he said. She wished me to take her with me when I left here. Why? Talia asked. Because she wished to escape. What and why she would not say. She said that no one would believe her if she were to say what it was. She first offered me money, but I dared not risk the damage to my trade if these people were made wroth. Still she persisted. In the end, she agreed that she would disappear a day before I was to leave, so that it would seem I had naught to do with it, and as payment, she offered herself. He sighed. It was wrong, surely, but I am only flesh, and she was comely, 
It did not seem so evil that I should have pleasure of her in return for an escape she desired so badly. I was to have met her on the road outside of town tomorrow night, after dusk. After I spoke to her this morning, I did not see her again alive. The glow did not falter, nor did Talia feel the drain of energy that would have indicated that the traitor was being forced to tell the truth. The crowd, which had been watching the glow intently, sighed again. Now it was obvious to everyone that the traitor could not be guilty. But then, who was? Lies! Oh, lies! The stepfather broke free of his neighbors and plunged forward with the apparent intent of strangling the traitor with his bare hands. Roland reared, ears laid back and snapped at him, keeping him away, as Talia herself drew her dagger with a hiss of metal, and in the rush of his anger and, yes, fear, Talia saw the scene his emotions carried and knew the truth. Hold him, she ordered, and several strong men rushed him and pinioned his arms against his sides despite his struggles. Despite what she knew, she could not accuse him solely on the basis of what she'd seen. But from the rest of what she'd picked up, she might not need to. Carly Sester, where is she? Talia demanded and many hands pushed the pale, shrinking girl forward, a girl of about fourteen, with a sweet, timid face and dark eyes and hair. I don't want to force you to speak, Talia told her in a soft voice no one else could hear, but I will if I have to. Will you tell us the truth about this man who calls himself your father, and be free? She had cringed when shoved before Talia, but the herald's kindly voice and the reassurance she was trying to show revived her, and the last words, be free, seemed to set new courage in her. She stood up straighter and stared at her stepfather with hate. Yes, yes, her voice was shrill with defiance. I'll tell the truth. It was him, our so kind father, that Carly wanted to escape from. And why? because he has been making us lie with him every night since Mother died. The accusing words rang in the sudden silence. The villagers stared at the girl and her stepfather in stunned amazement. Lion slut! The man screamed into the shocked quietude, struggling against the hands that held him. I speak nothing but the truth! She shouted back, her eyes dilated with fear, and something more— something of anger and rage and shame. When we cried, when we fought, he beat us, then he raped us. Carly swore she'd escaped somehow, but he found out, said he'd teach her to mend her ways. She lies. Do I? Then hold him for six months and wait, she laughed wildly. You all know he hasn't let a male older than five near me since last winter. I would have gone with Carly, but how could I earn a copper, bulge him with child, his child, his bastard? She broke down, sobbing hysterically, and one of the women darted forward without hesitation to throw a shawl around her in a protective, maternal gesture, followed by others who formed a comforting circle around the girl, shielding her from the sight of her ravisher and glaring at him with hate-filled and disgusted eyes. Talia confronted him, shaking with outrage, but somehow controlling her own revulsion. You went seeking the child and found her with the traitor. You decided to confront her, teach her a lesson. You became angry when she defied you, thinking herself safe because she was in a public place. You beat her and killed her, then hid her body in the traitor's wagon, knowing he'd be blamed, knowing that if he was killed before I arrived, no one would ever look farther for the real murderer. She was transferring the truth spell to him, even as she accused him, forcing him to speak his real thoughts when next he opened his mouth. It worked more thoroughly than she had imagined it would. Yes, and why not? Do I not feed and clothe them? Am I not their owner? They are mine, like their slut of a mother. She died without giving me my money's worth, and by the gods it is their duty to fill her place. Talia was nauseated by the mind behind those words. No punishment seemed adequate to her to fit what he had done. An odd, disinterested corner of her weighed all the facts and coldly made a thought-out, logical decision. Her revulsion and anger built until she could no longer contain it, and then, 
It found the outlet that matched the decision she'd come to. She forced rapport on him. Not the gentle sharing she had had with Chris, but a brutal, mental rape such as she had not dreamed she was capable of. Then, with a sideways twist, she pulled the stepdaughter into the union and forced her memories into his mind, forced him to be her through all her pain-filled and horrified experiences. He gave a single, gargling howl, stiffened, then dropped to his knees. His startled captors released him, but he was in no shape to take advantage of the situation. When they pulled him to his feet, his mouth hung slack and drooling, and there was no trace of sanity left in his eyes. Talia had locked him into a never-ending loop as he relived over and over every waking moment that his stepdaughter had spent as his victim. The villagers moved away from her, one involuntary pace. Now she'd just shown them what she could do. Harold, one of the men said timidly, looking at her with respect tinged with fear. They knew that she had punished him herself, even if they had no idea how. What must we do with him? What you please, she said wearily, and according to your own customs, whether he lives or dies, he has been dealt with. As they took him away, one of the women caught her attention. Harold, we have heard you have mind magic. Is there aught you can do for this girl? And I am a midwife. Would you take it amiss if she should lose the child? Though I am not gifted, I learned my craft among healers. It can be done with no harm to her. In for a lamb, she thought and nodded. The people were dispersing too shocked and appalled even to whisper among themselves. Talia stumbled wearily to the knot of women and knelt beside the shivering, sobbing girl. She eased into trance and probed as Carithan had taught her. She could read, though she could not act on what she read. It was as she had suspected. The girl was too young, the knot born malformed. She transferred her attention to the girl's mind and began laying the foundation for a healing that time and courage could complete without any further intervention on Talia's part, imprinting as forcefully as she could that none of this had been the girl's own fault. Lastly, she sent the girl into a half-trance which would last for several days, during which the damage done to her body, at least, could be mended. She stood bone-weary, and faced the midwife. What you suggest would happen eventually, and it will be easier on her body if it were to happen now. She hates what she bears as much as she hates the father, and the cleansing of her body may bring some ease to her heart. And tell her that she was never to blame for this. Tell her until she believes it. The midwife nodded without speaking and she and the others led the half-aware girl to her house. Only the traitor was left. His eyes brimmed with tears and gratitude. The proximity of his clean, normal mind was infinitely comforting to Talia. After the running sewer of the stepfather, he seemed like a clear, sparkling stream. Lady Herald, he faltered at last. My life is yours. Then take it and do good with it, traitor, she replied, burying her face in Roland's neck, feeling her companion's gentle touch slowly cleansing her of contamination. The traitor's footsteps receded, and the sound of three sets of hooves was approaching. They rang with the unmistakable chime of companion hooves on stone and were accompanied by the soft sound of gently moving bridle bells. Oh, goddess, help me she thought. No more I can't bear any more. But the hoofs continued to approach, and then she heard footsteps and felt hands take her shoulders. She looked up. It was Chris. I saw the end, and I heard the rest from the midwife, he said quietly, but... But you made a judgment and a punishment, Harold, said a strange voice, a female voice, age roughened but strong. Talia looked beyond Chris to see two unfamiliar faces, 
a woman about Karen's age, but strongly and squarely built, and a young man perhaps a year or two older than Chris, with mouse-brown hair. Both wore the arrows of special messengers on the sleeves of their whites. Special couriers. Their companions must have sensed the trouble and brought them to help. And they were senior heralds. You did use your gift on that man, did you not? The young man asked, somberly. Yes, she replied, meeting their eyes. I did, and I would do the same if the circumstances warranted it. Do you judge that to be an ethical use of your gift? Is shooting raiders an ethical use of my hands? She countered. It's part of me. It is totally in my control. It does not control me. I made a reasoned and thought-out decision. If the man ever accepts his own guilt and the fact that what he did was wrong, he'll break free of the compulsion I put on him. Until then he will suffer exactly as he made his victim suffer. That seemed to me to be far more in keeping with his crime than imprisoning or executing him. So I judged and meted out punishment. I stand by it, and I would do it again. She regarded them both with a certain defiance, and somewhat to her surprise, they both nodded with a certain amount of satisfaction. Then I think that we are not needed here after all, said the woman. Clear roads to you, brother, sister. They wheeled their companions and rode back out the gates without a single backward glance. That left only Chris. You did very well, Harold Talia, he said gently. She stood wearily in the firm grasp of his hands, with his voice recalling her to duty. She longed beyond telling to lay that duty on him, and she knew that if she asked, he would take it. But if she laid it on anyone, she would be proving false to her calling. If this were a normal circuit, there would be no Chris to take up the burden of her tasks because she felt too worn, too sickened, too exhausted, and yes, too cowardly, too cowardly to face all those people and prove again to them that their trust was not misplaced, that a herald could bring healing as well as punishment, and they must be shown yet again that, though a herald had powers the guilty had to fear, the innocent would never feel them. She must face the fear in those faces and turn it back into trust. Chris could not do that for her, and if he were not here, she would not even have the brief luxury of imagining that he could. She sighed, and hearing the weariness, the pain in that sigh, Chris almost wished that she'd ask for him to take over. His heart ached for her, but this was the trial by fire that every herald had to face, soon or late, and she most of all. No matter what the personal cost, a herald's duty must come first. She had proven that her gift was under her control. She had proven that she was willing to accept the ethical and moral responsibilities that particular gift laid upon her. Now she must prove she had the emotional and mental strength to carry any job she undertook to its end. She had no choice, and neither did he. They had accepted this responsibility along with every other aspect of becoming a herald, but he hurt for her. She looked up and must have seen his thoughts writ plainly in his eyes. I'd better locate the town council, the mayor and the clerk, she said, pulling herself up straight and schooling her face into calm. There's work to do. As Chris watched her walk away, head high, carriage confident, nothing reflecting her inner agony, he felt a glow of pride. Now she was truly a herald. Chris preceded her to the way station nearest the town and had all in readiness when she rode up, shoulders slumped in exhaustion. The rules governing both of them allowed him to do that much for her at least. She sought their bed long before he, and was apparently asleep by the time he joined her, but in the darkness he felt her shaken with silent tears and gathered her into his arms to weep herself to sleep on his shoulder. The second day she took reports and news, and began settling grievances. Chris winced to see how warily the townsfolk regarded her, like some creature from legend, powerful, and not necessarily to be trusted. 
It was well that this was such a large place, for after her performance of the previous day, it might have been difficult to find those willing to have her sit in judgment over them, except that there was no choice in the matter here. Anyone with a grievance to settle before a herald in a place this size must register that fact in writing. With the witness of their own words, there was not one of them bold enough to deny his original will. Talia had the right to choose the order of their judgments. Normally she did not exercise that right, but she chose otherwise this time. Wisely, she picked those cases to settle that required tact, understanding, and gentleness to come first. Gradually the townsfolk began to relax in her presence, began to lose their fear of her. By the third day they were laughing at the occasional wry jest she inserted into her comments. By day's end, the fear was forgotten. By the fourth day, when she took her leave of them, she had regained their trust in heralds and more. Chris was so proud of her that he fairly shone with it as they rode on to their next stop. The gods must have agreed with him, for they were kind to Talia in this much at least. There were no further crises for the rest of the circuit. I can't believe it's over. <laughs> You'd better... Chris laughed, since that's the rendezvous point ahead of us, and unless my eyes are deceiving me, they're not. That's a companion grazing, and I think I see two mules. So, tonight is the last we'll spend in a way station for a while. Sorry? That I won't be eating your cooking or mine or sleeping on straw? Be serious, Chris chuckled and squinted against the light of the westering sun. Hawk! he intoned melodramatically. Methinks our relief hath heard the silver sound of our companion's hooves. Or the rattling of your few thoughts in your empty head. Talia kneed Roland, and they galloped into the lead. It's Griffin! Sure enough, it was Talia's yearmate, who had gotten into White's at the same time, but evidently finished his own internship early. She slid off Roland's back after both of them had pulled up beside him with a clattering of hooves and jangling of bridal bells and delivered a hearty kiss and embrace that sent him blushing as red as ever she had. He greeted Chris with such obvious relief that both of them were hard put to keep from chuckling at his bashfulness. There's an inn just a half hour down the road from here he told them, stammering a trifle. They're expecting you. I thought you'd probably rather sleep soft tonight, so when Forrest caught the edges of Roland's sending, I rode down there and warned them. Right, and thanks, Chris answered for both of them, touched by the unexpected courtesy. Seems like it's been forever since we had real beds. Not true, Talia interrupted him. We had a real bed just a bit over four months ago with Tedrick. So we did, but it still seems like forever. That reminds me, though, my first bit of advice to you is to always plan to stop at the northernmost resupply station. It's right near Berry Bay. Tedrick is a good host, loves having company, and his cooking. Chris rolled his eyes heavenward in mock ecstasy. And my first bit of advice is to watch out for the other northernmost surprise. Briefly, Talia outlined the plague's symptoms and described how it had decimated Waymeat. They took turns detailing some of the hazards and pitfalls of this circuit, then turned their churras and their remaining supplies over to him. Griffin helped them load their own gear on his mules, and by the time it was dusk, he was well settled into the station, and they were ready to be on their way. As the lights of the inn shone through the darkness ahead of them, Chris sensed Talia's involuntary shiver. I know, he told her softly. Now it's over, and now is when it really starts to get hard. But you're ready. Trust me, little bird, you are ready. You're sure? She replied in a small, doubtful voice. As sure as I've ever been of anything in my life. You've been ready since Westmark. If you can handle that, you can handle anything. Touchy nobles, heirs with adolescent traumas, heart-wounded heralds, moon-calf heralds with life bonds, she asked, with a tinge of sarcasm. Even that, especially that. You haven't let it get in the way of anything yet, and you won't now. You're ready, dear heart, and if you dare make a liar out of me, 
You'll what? I'll, I'll commission a bard to write you into something scathing. Great goddess, she reeled in the saddle, clutching her heart as if stabbed, her high spirits restored. A death worse than fate. See that you behave yourself, then, he grinned. Now come on, there's dinner waiting and soft feather beds, and after that... Yes, she sighed, staring down the road to the south. Home. At last. This concludes Arrow's Flight by Mercedes Lackey, narrated by Krista Lewis. Copyright 1987 by Mercedes R. Lackey. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Daw Books Incorporated and was produced in the year 2018 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.